we start today? Okay, honorable members of city council in accordance with Virginia Beach City Code 2-21 and the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Virginia Beach, I hereby call for a special formal session of the Virginia Beach Council on Tuesday, March 26, 2024, 12 p.m. City Council Conference Room uh, 2034, Building 1, City Hall, 2nd Floor, 2401 Courthouse Drive. They make me read all that stuff. <laughs> uh, the purpose of this special formal session is to allow City Council to convene into a closed session at the conclusion of the regularly scheduled formal session where the formal following matters will be discussed. Publicly held property, District 2, District 2, District 2. Personnel matters, Council appointments, Council boards, commissions, committees, authorities, agencies, task force, and appointees. And at the conclusion of the closed session, the City Council will reconvene into an open session for the purpose of certifying the closed session. Uh, sincerely, Bob Dyer, Mayor. Um, at this point, uh, we're going to have a little change in the agenda and invite our friends and colleagues from the schools uh, you know, to come up and have a chat with us. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Dyer, Vice Mayor Wilson, and City Council members. I am Kim Melnick, Chair of the Virginia Beach School Board, and I am joined today by Dr. Donald Robertson, Division Superintendent, Crystal Pate, Chief Financial Officer, Jack Freeman, Chief Operations Officer, and my colleagues, Jennifer Franklin, Beverly Anderson, and Mike Callan. I thought it would be helpful to share the mission statement of Virginia Beach City Public Schools. As you review this statement, I would like to call your attention to key language in partnership with the entire community. This phrase serves to note the critical connection between the work done in our schools and the roles family and citizens play in the overall success of our community. Together, we have created a highly sought after educational environment that adds value to our community and attracts business. Our vision statement serves to focus our mission into an aspirational statement of our achievement goal for every student in our division. And on this slide is our vision statement. Every student is achieving at his or her maximum potential in an engaging, inspiring, and challenging learning environment. Our work is grounded in our five core values. Put students first, seek growth, be open to change, do great work together, and value differences. In these five core values, we view the city as partners in helping us to put students first by doing great work together. My final slide provides a listing of the key budget priorities of the school board, and they may look similar to some of the priorities the council has for the city. Our priorities include identifying compensation solutions to attract and retain staff, maintaining high quality service levels for students, families, and staff, preparing to implement new curriculum adopted by the Virginia Department of Education in English, math, and science, addressing facility maintenance and renovations, as well as continuing to improve safety and security measures through our capital improvement program. I am confident that in the remainder of this presentation, you will see evidence of our successes and rationale in support of our needs. And now I turn it over to Dr. Robertson. Welcome, Doc. Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Melnick. And again, good afternoon. I uh, certainly appreciate the opportunity to present to you today. Um, and the where I'm gonna start is with what Jack Freeman has brought to us from the military, it's called BLUFF. And BLUFF stands for the bottom line up front. And so I thought the most important thing that I want us to get out of this presentation is the, is the key to success is hiring great employees. And many of you on the council are successful, successful business officials and have worked in various organizations throughout your distinguished careers. You know full well that the key to success for every business or organization is to hire the best people 
as high quality employees bring great and long lasting value to the business company or schools they represent. And so I want to review some facts with you. I didn't want to cut it off though. All right, here we go. Uh, in Virginia Beach City Public Schools, we staff over 10,000 full-time employees every year, of which of 5,000 of those are teachers. And each year we hire approximately 450 new teachers, of which approximately 350 have no ties to this area. And teachers are probationary for their first three years, which means they have very little movement they can make. But after a successful three years, they earn continuing contract status and have many opportunities to change schools, divisions, or some even may leave the profession. And what I would like to do right now is take you through a scenario, if you would. Again, bottom line up front. In this, in this scenario, I ask you to work with me for just for a few moments, as I believe your participation will help everyone to understand our concerns with the loss of local funding. So in this scenario, each of you represents a top group of teacher candidates who have recently graduated with a master's in education. One group is from a collection of historically black colleges and universities, and the other group is from several schools of education in the state of Pennsylvania. I am going to serve as the recruitment manager, not as a superintendent of Virginia Beach City Public Schools, and I'm going to be providing to you three job offers, one from Virginia Beach, one from Chesapeake, and one from Norfolk. And I'm going to ask you to review those job offers uh, for a moment from this perspective. Again, I chose historically black colleges and universities in the state of Pennsylvania because in my 36 years, the best quality candidates we have ever attracted from outside of Virginia have come from those two groups. In fact, we have senior leadership sitting in this room that went to either an, a historically black college or university or came to us as teachers from Pennsylvania. That's why you're the, the group you are. And so at this point, what I would like you to do is know that you have an offer to teach. If you're a high school math teacher, you have an offer to teach in front of you from three to school divisions for math, if it's English. So the offer is the same. But as you open those envelopes, I'd like you to consider the offer. You are 22, 23 years old. You do not live in Virginia. You are extraordinary candidates, which is why we have come to find you. You are the top quality employee we want. So you have an offer with compensation in there, and you have apartment listings from a selection of apartments in each of the cities. And I'll give you a moment to study those. So if I can offer my opinion, and it is my opinion, as to how most of, if not all of you, would respond based on my, on my 36 years of working with teachers, none of you would pick Virginia Beach City Public Schools. Because in this group of outstanding candidates, not from this area, VBCPS offers no extra benefit, like having family or friends here. The candidates' decisions will most likely be based solely on compensation 
and cost of living. And given we will have to hire staff, we'll likely be dipping into the next level of candidates and face the same dilemma. At some point, there will be candidates left that have not been chosen by other divisions or not chosen other divisions, and I fear this group will not be of the quality our school community demands that has benefited from for many years. And again, as noted on this slide, we, each year we hire approximately 450 new teachers and approximately 350 of those teachers are not from this area. Educational research suggests a high quality teacher, like the groups that you represent in this scenario, deliver 18 months of learning growth in one school year. While less quality teachers deliver, deliver less than 12 months of growth in that same time period. And this places students in those classrooms at a significant disadvantage and at the same time requires a great deal of support from schools and central office staff who are trying to help them improve their craft. Over the past two years in particular, we have had to contract with outside agencies to provide high quality content teachers to work in some of our schools to ensure our students are getting the high quality staff they need and deserve. These individuals are available, but they come at a price. And that price is well above the salary of a teacher. And it also requires we place a long-term substitute in the classroom, which further increases the cost. With any additional loss of funding, we'll have to reduce or even eliminate this practice, which has delivered quality results to our students and simply rely on a long-term substitute who may or may not be qualified in the subject in which they teach. So I thought it would also be helpful to provide some specific information about Virginia Beach City Public Schools that some of you may not realize because sometimes when you live in the house, you don't recognize how great the house is. We're the fourth largest school division out of 131 in the state of Virginia and the 59th largest in the country out of 13,318 school divisions. Our 64,000 students are spread across 86 schools and centers and served by approximately 14,000 full and part-time employees. In fact, Virginia Beach City Public Schools is larger than the Norfolk and Chesapeake School Divisions combined. In Virginia Beach City Public Schools, we provide a plethora of programs, academies, advanced academic programs, career and technical education, gifted and specialty. In short, we provide our students with a private school education in a public school setting. As you can imagine, providing these levels of service to our students and families costs millions of additional dollars each year. Yet this is what our community has repeatedly told us they value. Without adequate funding, we may have to face the realization that we can no longer continue some of these specialty programs that distinguish Virginia Beach City Public Schools so that we can meet our number one budget priority of attracting and retaining high quality staff like yourself through a competitive compensation package. A key driver of funding at the state level is also student enrollment. Over the past decade, we've observed a slow but steady decline in enrollment numbers. However, it is imperative to recognize that despite this overall trend, the evolving needs of our student body are expected to exert a growing influence on our budgetary considerations. In particular, we have witnessed and anticipate ongoing increases in several student demographic groups that necessitate additional resources and support. These include 504 students, captured on the top right of this graph, of this slide, which have tripled in the last 10 years. Economically disadvantaged students, captured on the lower left, which has increased 13% over the past 10 years to 46% of the students of Virginia Beach are on free and reduced lunch. English language learners, which has doubled over the past five years and students with disabilities with the currently exceed 13%. Of course, not captured in any of these graphs are those students who struggle with mental health challenges or the increasing number of homeless students and students in shared housing situations in our division. This year, we are serving over 700 homeless students and over 5,200 students in a shared housing situation. When one considers this data, it means that the average classroom has a larger number of students in one or more of these groups 
than students not captured in one or more of these groups. And we know in certain schools, these numbers comprise the majority of the student body. And in these cases, we must provide additional support for those schools so they are able to meet each student's needs. Remember, the vision is every student. Under circumstances like these, one would expect a corresponding decline in student performance. But that is not what has occurred in Virginia Beach City Public Schools, as you will see over the next few slides. We are driven by the goals of our strategic framework, Compass of 2025, and here you see the six goals of our strategic plan. And I'll draw your attention to goals four through six as they align most of the conversation today. An exemplary diversified workforce, a mutually beneficial partnership, and organizational effectiveness and efficiencies. And also captured on this slide is on the right is our six goals with the graduate profile that's pictured in the middle. Our focus in Virginia Beach City Public Schools is to create future ready learners, learners who will be equally prepared to enroll, enlist, or be employed after graduation. Once again, we display our graduate profile listing the eight attributes we deem critical to preparing future ready learners. Three of those include being knowledgeable, being personally and socially responsible, and being communicators and collaborators. Under goal one, and in the next several slides, we'll list just a few pieces of evidence of our success as it's related to each of the goals of Compass of 2025. I'm not gonna read each bullet to you, but please know we have even more data that speaks to the extraordinary work done by our staff and students. And this slide represents goal one. This slide represents evidence of success under goal two, student well-being. This slide provides evidence of success under goal three, student ownership of learning. And I'll call your attention to the 13,000 credentials that our students earned last year. That's the most in the state and Fairfax has three times as many students. Our fourth goal is exemplary diversified staff. And of course it is in this area that the city council shares as partners in the achievements noted on this slide as this would not have been possible without, without your support last year and the support of the community and, and, allow, and helping us to implement the largest compensation package that we've been able to do to date, and that was last year. Goal five, mutually beneficial partnerships. Really proud of the work we've done here out of the Office of Family and Community Engagement. Goal six is organizational effectiveness and efficiency, and I don't offer this goal area as evidence and represents the return on investment Virginia Beach City Public Schools provides to the City Council as, as funders and the community for the financial support we receive each year. Now, if you recall earlier, we talked about the changing demographics. And here's where I want to point out to comparison data. One could surmise that perhaps we, our data would be flat or even declining and under these circumstances, but not in Virginia Beach City Public Schools. So when we turn our attention to student achievement as measured by the Virginia Standards of Learning Test, needs, we know that what happens in the classroom delivers these type of results. And when comparing Hampton Roads seven cities, Virginia Beach City Public Schools, as a group, outperformed all other cities in the subject areas, except for history where Chesapeake outperformed us by one percentage point and math where Chesapeake and Virginia Beach had the same pass rate. In each tested area, Virginia Beach outperformed the state by eight to 10 percentage points. But we're competitive in Virginia Beach, and I know you are too. So we picked out the highest performing large school divisions in the Commonwealth and compared ourselves against them. And this slide compares our performance to those other comparable school divisions, many of them you will recognize. When looking at pass rates by subject, Virginia Beach City Public Schools as a group outperformed 
all listed comparable divisions in reading, math, and science. In writing and history, Virginia Beach was second to Loudoun County. That's not going to happen this year. We're, we're going to not let Dr. Spence uh, claim that victory after this year. But again, the performance here is a measure, it's apples to apples comparison. And our performance is demonstrated the great work our students and staff do. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over. Well, actually, I've got one more. Before I turn it over to Ms. Pate, our Chief Financial Officer, I want to talk about how Virginia Beach City Public Schools provides a high return on investment to the community it proudly serves. You see, Virginia Beach City Public Schools boasts the top-rated elementary school, Kingston, and top-rated middle school, Old Donation in Virginia. In fact, we had nine schools represented in the top 50 schools in the Commonwealth. Virginia Beach City Public Schools Principal Sham Bevel was a finalist for the National Middle School Principal of the Year. Once again, we're going to have a blue ribbon school. I can't tell you what it is yet. It's embargoed. But that will be the fourth such school in the last six years, an extraordinary accomplishment. According to the latest niche rankings, which is kind of where you go to to get your educational rankings, Virginia Beach is the fifth best school division out of 131 in Virginia. We're the 683rd best school division out of the 10,932 divisions that were ranked by niche. If, if you need a percentile, that puts us in the 94th percentile. We're the 11th best place to teach in Virginia. And niche rank notes, these rankings reflect Virginia Beach's City Public Schools commitment to education, diversity, and overall excellence. The district continues to strive for educational excellence and student success. And you talk about fiduciary responsibility for the 26th consecutive year, our finance department has received the Government Finance Officers Association Certif Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting and the Association of School Business Offices International Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting. And of course, a sad but true fact, the cost of living in Virginia Beach is the highest in Southampton Roads. And I share this because I think it's important for all of us to understand that the accomplishments of Virginia Beach City Public Schools are due in large part to you, to this city. Because through this body, the City Council has provided us local funding through the revenue sharing formula that has allowed us to have the programs that we have. And it is the envy of so many of my colleagues to have such a partnership. And in Virginia Beach, we have always not just recognized, but deeply understood that Virginia Beach City Public Schools is an economic driver for the growth and success of our great city. In fact, I've heard many of you share this thought on numerous occasions, as we all are proud of our outstanding school division. Unfortunately, there are times, and I believe this is one time, when the price of this success is under serious consideration. And I would offer the previous slides as evidence that for every dollar you invest in Virginia Beach City Public Schools, we will provide a return on investment that's measured by the high quality of life for all of our residents and the rising property values that lead to increased revenues to our city because people want to relocate their kids to Virginia Beach for what the city offers and what the schools offer. And I would ask how many investments do you have that can make this claim and provide this data to back it up? And now I'll turn it over to Ms. Pate. Thank you, Dr. Robertson. Good afternoon, Mayor Dyer, Vice Mayor Wilson, members of City Council, Mr. Dehaney. I appreciate the opportunity to present to you our proposed budget for fiscal year 2024-25. Over the course of several discussions with senior leadership, Dr. Robertson and the school board, we have meticulously crafted our budget balancing efforts aiming to navigate the challenges posed by lower than anticipated state revenue from the governor's budget. In the forthcoming slides, I will delve into the measures we have taken to address a significant decrease in state revenue and a proposed decrease in local revenue. Our focus has been how do we confront these decreases and still maintain our commitment to meeting the needs of our students. In response to these fiscal realities, we have identified areas where reductions and strategic cuts could be made that would have the least impact on the quality of education we provide each day. We conducted a thorough assessment of staffing levels at the central office 
implementing a freeze on non-critical vacancies for coordinator and below positions. At the direction of Dr. Robertson, our chief officers, who through careful scrutiny of their respective budgets, identified over $1.4 million in savings. Even with these measures in place, balancing our budget in light of the diminished state revenue and potential loss of local revenue has necessitated difficult decisions. However, I can assure you that we have made every effort to mitigate the impact of these reductions on instructional programming. The information on this slide highlights our primary budget challenges. We remain challenged with employee compensation, which impacts our recruitment and retention of staff, especially instructional staff, as we compete with other localities. While there was progress compared to the division's seventh place ranking in entry level salaries last year, recent fiscal year 2025 budget proposals for other divisions have resulted in us losing ground. Based on where divisions are currently with compensation for next fiscal year, Virginia Beach City Public Schools ranks sixth place out of seven with regards to starting salary. We are just ahead of Newport News by $5. Let me repeat that. We are sixth out of seventh, at, and our starting salary is only $5 higher than that of Newport News, which ranks seventh. I will cover what we included in the budget for compensation in a later slide. The biennial rebenchmarking process updated our local composite index, or LCI. The local composite index determines the state and local share of funding for the division. Localities with a lower LCI receive more state funding than those with a higher index. We saw an increase in our LCI for the 2024-2026 biennium, resulting in lower state revenue. Based on our current information, we are seeing a reduction in state revenue of approximately $5 million due to the increase in our LCI. Over the 2024-25 proposed budget includes only a 1.6% increase in revenue over our amended adopted 2023-24 budget. With inflation hovering at 3.5%, this minimal increase will result next year in less buying power and dollar value as compared to the current year. Per the governor's proposed budget for fiscal year 24-25, we only saw an increase in state funding, including state sales tax, of $545,000. The conference report coming out of the General Assembly session does show additional revenue. However, the governor has concerns over the budget proposal. On April 17th, the General Assembly is scheduled to reconvene to consider the governor's proposed amendments and or vetoes so the final state budget is still unknown. As both entities are experiencing, we are also challenged with the increasing cost of goods and services due to inflation. This impacts our contractual obligations as well as our fuel, utilities, et cetera. And finally, the Federal Elementary and Secondary Emergency Relief, or ESSER funding, expires September 30th, 2024. Due to the sunsetting of this funding, during the budget development process, we needed to go through the exercise of identifying, identifying positions and non-personnel costs that were deemed essential to continue, meaning we needed to place them into the operating budget. To add to our existing challenges, the General Assembly recently directed the Joint Legislative Audit and Review Commission, known as JLARC, to study the cost of education in Virginia and make an accurate assessment of the cost of the Standards of Quality, or SOQ. In terms of funding, the 2023 JLARC report found that the state SOQ formula yields substantially less funding than actual division spending and benchmarks. Virginia school divisions receive less K-12 funding per student than the 50-state average, the regional average, and three of Virginia's bordering states. JLARC reported the SOQ formula not only underestimates the number of K-12 staff needed, but also school divisions compensation cost. The study also found that the formula does not adequately account for higher needs students. State funding for at-risk students, special education students, and English learner students is less than the level of funding determined necessary to educate them in cost studies performed in other states. In addition, the SOQ formula relies on an outdated measure to determine the number of at-risk students. 
The JLARC study made several recommendations and provided valuable insights for policymakers and education stakeholders in Virginia to consider as they work towards improving the state's education system. On this slide, you will see some of the preemptive measures we included to balance the CON. In looking at positions, we have broken the changes down by state category. In instruction, we have a reduction of 80.3 positions. The majority of this reduction is a combination of enrollment changes and the increased staffing ratio for middle and high from 21.25 to 1 to 21.75 to 1. In admin, attendance, and health, we have a net decrease of 2.8 positions, and you can see in the table what comprises that reduction. We had zero position changes in pupil transportation. Under operation and maintenance, we had an increase in positions of 22.6. The majority of this increase resulted in the addition of 15 security assistants at the elementary level. Initially, we wanted to add 30 security assistants, security assistant positions at the elementary level to provide two of these positions at each school, but the budget currently cannot support the cost. Our hope will be to provide the remaining 15 elementary schools with a second security assistant next year. And if I could point out, the 21.25 to 1. Can you get the microphone? Oh. Oh. Yeah. yeah, if I could point out, the 21.25 to 1 does not mean the average class size is 21.25 to 1, and now it's 21.75 to 1. That's not how it works. It's how many staff are allocated to a building. So the class size increase as a result of that change is going to be one to two students. So at high school, it's normally about 26 to 27. It'll now be 28 to 29. At middle school, it's 31 to 32. It might be 33 to 34. So I just want to let you know that. And so in the last category of technology, we had a net increase of 3.5 positions. And you can see in the description what comprises this net increase. So the total decrease in positions for the school operating fund is 57 positions. On this slide, you see some additional measures we included to balance the CON. I mentioned earlier in the presentation that we worked with chief officers who carefully reviewed their existing budgets and identified over $1.4 million in savings. We reduced each school's budget by 5% at a cost of approximately $300,000. We reduced the cost of site assigned subs by over a million dollars. We transferred our contract with communities and schools to our All In Virginia grant. This program serves five of our Title I schools and may have to be discontinued next year if funds are not allotted once again. Through renegotiating the terms of various contracts, we were able to reduce contractual costs by $100,000. As we navigate a two cent tax reduction, Virginia Beach City Public Schools has thoroughly reviewed our budget, aiming to preserve vital services and programs by identifying areas for potential savings. This process has involved making tough decisions to prioritize spending, leading to adjustments in staffing, resource allocation, and operational strategies. The lines in blue were cut to balance to a one cent reduction, and the lines in green were cut to balance to a two cent reduction. One significant adjustment involves eliminating the budget allocation for replacement school buses, totaling a little over $2.3 million. To stay on a reasonable replacement cycle, we replace about 20 of these buses annually. In any one given year, this type of impact can be managed. However, it's crucial to note that prolonged periods without adhering to a replacement cycle could pose reliability risk for our fleet. Additionally, we, pro we propose extending the maintenance cycle for landscaping services, saving a little over $478,000. This extension will lengthen the mowing cycle at schools, potentially affecting aesthetics and usability by schools, parks and rec, and the community, particularly during peak growth periods and extended rainfall. We are reducing the budget increase for general maintenance by approximately $135,000, acknowledging the substantial recent rise in repair costs. While this reduction carries a slight risk regarding our financial ability to address repairs, it's a necessary step in our cost savings efforts. We're also cutting $546,000 from Central Office Temporary Employment Agreements, or TEAs. TEA staff fill vitally essential roles when we cannot find full or part-time staff to fill vacancies. TEAs are cost-effective as they do not include the additional costs for benefits. 
Another adjustment involves replacing FEV tutoring, resulting in a savings of $450,000. Revised recommendations to balance the additional one cent cut in real estate tax rate include a cut to unified insights of over $198,000 and we are cutting 8.5 central office positions, saving approximately $664,000. While currently see these positions are unfilled, this decision may limit our ability to hire should the need arise. We also recommended additional staff cuts to include four secondary assistant principals, three library media assistants, one instructional technology specialist, and one technology support technician for a total of approximately $789,000. The next four slides contain detailed information that outlines specific items that the operating budget needed to address due to the expiration of ESSER funds, the impact of inflation, and required expenses. We cannot understate how important and valuable ESSER federal funds were and are to Virginia Beach City Public Schools. The over $129 million in extra funds allowed us to introduce new program resources to address a fully remote and hybrid learning environment. It allowed us to secure additional resources to support the health and welfare of our staff and students. It allowed us to expand our infrastructure to address environmental and safety needs, and it provided us with the ability to expand staffing to address critical need areas. I will give you a moment to review the items on this slide. On this slide, I would like to highlight various line items which would reflect escalated expenses for goods, services, and contractual obligations projected for the 24-25 year. For example, in looking at line one and three, you will see increases for the Virginia Preschool Initiative, known as VPI, of over $621,000, and in line three for Green Run Collegiate of approximately $509,000. There was also an increase in the athletic fund transfer in the amount of approximately $596,000 due to increased costs related to officials, uniforms, equipment, and security. I also want to point out the $929,000 for an increase in extended school year personnel, or ESY. ESY is a service provided to students whose IEP teams have determined they require such services. The population of students requiring ESY services has grown tremendously over the past several years, partly due to the pandemic and related learning loss. We've included a $690,000 increase in for the rising cost of our contract for CSEP tuition, and we included $668,000 to cover the cost of the increase in our student transportation contract to private day facilities as required. On this slide, we highlight a noteworthy increase of $600,000 attributed to amplified expenses for homeless education taxi services in accordance with the McKinney-Vento Act. Enacted to address the educational needs of homeless children and youth, the McKinney-Vento Act ensures that these individuals have access to appropriate transportation to and from school, among other essential services. Recall Dr. Robertson shared we are serving over 700 homeless students this year and we'll give you a moment to review the remaining of the slide. <coughs> On this slide, we highlight an increased cost for general maintenance of $600,000, and the increased cost for the ground services paid to the city of over $478,000, which we subsequently cut as a cost-saving measure mentioned earlier to meet the two-cent real estate tax rate reduction. In building our budget for the next fiscal year, we had to factor various expenditures into the budget to avoid the risk of degradation or interruption of services. This exercise reflected our priorities and our values of providing a high level of programming and service to our students, families, and staff. As noted here, the increased cost was approximately $12.6 million just to continue providing the services the division has provided over the past few years. The impact of inflation on the cost of goods and services, combined with the loss of ESSER funds, were the driver of, drivers of this reality. So I just covered the items that we included to continue providing the services we have provided over the past few years. Here are some additional increases to note. 
You are aware we gave a 2% raise that was implemented in January 2024. Essentially, this 2% raise was additional state money for SOQ positions only and equated to a 1% raise for fiscal year 2024 for the January through June 2024 timeframe for all employees. It is important to note that in effect, an employee's pay effective Janu July 1st, 2024 at this time in the proposed budget only includes a step increase. Without this step increase, an employee's pay would not change effective July 1st, 2024. With the state budget unresolved, at this point, we were only able to include a 1.5% step increase to the teacher pay scale with no change to the starting salary and a 1% or 1.5% step increase for the unified scale based on years of experience. By not increasing the starting salary for teachers, and not having the ability to build in at any additional raise, we are losing ground when looking at other divisions on the teacher pay scale. Some good news for our lowest wage employees, the minimum wage was raised to $15 an hour. Also, the decision by Virginia Retirement System to uncouple the defined benefit and the voluntary contribution of the hybrid printing plan effective July 1st, 2024, will result in additional liability for the school division for the upcoming fiscal year and going forward of approximately $7 million on the, based on the estimated number of hybrid employees who have voluntary contributions required to be matched by the division. This becomes another unplanned expense that we must address. On this slide, you can see the total amount of funds, which is approximately $1.2 billion. The largest portion of the budget is allocated to the school operating fund with an approximate amount of $949 million, accounting for 82.1% of the overall budget. Categorical grants make up 11.8% or around $136 million, while other funds, including Instructional Technology Fund, Athletics Fund, Equipment Replacement Fund, Vending Operations Fund, Cafeteria Fund, and Textbooks represent 5.7% or about $66 million of the total budget. Additionally, there is Green Run Collegiate, a public charter school, which accounts for 0.4% or approximately $4.9 million. This slide provides an overview of the revenue sources for the school operating fund and their score corresponding percentages. The largest funding source is the local contribution from the city, accounting for 49.9% .9 of the total. This percentage reflects the net reduction in funding for the two cent real estate tax reduction. State funding, including state sales tax, is the second largest source at 48.1%, while federal funding makes up 1.6%, and other local sources contribute 0.4%. On the left side of the slide, there's a chart illustrating the estimated additional revenue over the fiscal year 2024 amended budget from all sources which amounts to approximately $14.8 million. These state figures are based on the governor's 2024-2026 introduced budget. During our five-year forecast presentation, it was mentioned that we are gradually phasing out one-time funds in our school reserve account. As a result, we are reducing this revenue source by 100% of the fiscal year 2024 budget allocation. In Virginia, educational funding is organized into specific categories outlined in Virginia State Code. These categories are fundamental for budgeting and reporting purposes within the education system. They include instruction covering expenses related to classroom teaching and resources, operations and maintenance, which addresses the upkeep of school facilities and services, pupil transportation accounting for costs associated with student transportation, administration attendance and health encompassing administrative and health related expenses, and finally technology covering techno technological infrastructure and resources for educational purposes. Aligning with these prescribed categories ensures transparency and accountability in the allocation of, of educational funds across the state. When looking at this slide, as you would expect, the instructional portion is the largest at 73.3%. Operation and maintenance is the second largest portion at 12%. Pupil transportation is 5.2%. Admin attendance and health is 4.8%. And technology is coming in at 4.7%. As previously mentioned, these categories are prescribed by the State Board of Education listed in the Virginia Code. 
Our chart of accounts is built around these categories for budgeting and reporting purposes. This slide shows the breakdown of school operating expenditures by type. Notably, our operations are heavily reliant on labor with personnel and fringe benefits expenses combined comprising nearly 86% of our total expenditures. The remaining allocation constituting 14% is dedicated to non-personnel expenses. However, a significant portion of this 14% is non-discretionary, attributed to essential items like ongoing contractual obligations, fuel, and utilities. Consequently, only a small fraction of this budget allows for discretionary spending or flexibility. I will now turn the pres presentation over to Jack Freeman, Chief Operations Officer, to discuss the Capital Improvement Program. Thank you, Ms. Pate. Good afternoon. Welcome. This year's proposed CIP prioritized the maintenance of our aging buildings. Historically, about half of our annual appropriations have been dedicated to new construction projects and half to what we refer to as maintenance projects. This shift is necessitated due to the consequences of inflation over about a decade and a half of reduced or level CIP funding. This slide shows the past three years of national inflation for school construction from the U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics. That's the three orange bars on the left. And the yellow are projected inflation rates for construction over the next, over the six year CIP. This type of inflation is not unique to schools. This slide shows projected loss in buying power due to inflation since 2009. Let's start from school year 2009-10 on the left. The dark blue bars represent actual CIP appropriations for each year. So that's 62.7 million in 2009-2010. And then you got 35 million in 10 and 11 and move so on to the right. The light blue bars represent the funding needed when accounting for that year's actual inflation to maintain buying power. As you follow those light blue bars from the left to the right, you see a transition from light blue to yellow bars. The yellow bars represent the projected inflation numbers that you saw on the last slide. Now, if you go back to the left, the gray bars that drop down represent the yearly deficit. And in red, it shows the actual value of the yearly deficit. And we've had a great deal of discussion with the school board about the effect of compounding inflation, and we do not have the time to go through those discussions with you today. Simply put, the compounding effect of inflation has a greater effect over time in the later years, and by school year 28-29, there is a 114 million projected loss in buying power in that year alone. If you add up all of the years, the estimated cumulative loss of buying power is $900 million. So if roughly half of the annual appropriations go to new construction projects and half go to maintenance projects, we project to lose about $450 million in buying power over the course of the six year CIP to maintenance projects. And we are seeing that impact. HVAC, re-roofing, foundation and fire alarm replacements, for example, have been underfunded. Operating under the currently adopted six-year CIP, we estimate that we can cover only about 18 to 31% of our HVAC life cycle replacements. For our re-roofing projects, it's about 55 to 63%. And for things like foundation repairs and fire alarm replacements, it's about 27 to 35%. So in this year's proposal, we've recommended shifting a greater percentage of annual appropriations to maintenance projects. In year one, maintenance projects would receive 44.8 million and new construction projects would receive 19 million. So about $12 million more going to maintenance projects than what we've historically done. Further, to not lose any more buying power for our maintenance projects, we've indexed maintenance projects to inflation. And that's the projected inflation that we showed you earlier. 
So you can see the green bars representing maintenance uh, goes up every year. And the consequence in a level funding environment is the new construction appropriations must be decreased each year to accommodate. And by year seven, just one year outside of the CIP, there will be no available appropriations for new construction projects. And here's the proposed funding summary. In addition to the greater annual appropriations going to maintenance projects, we've also proposed moving approximately 15 million from the Bayside High School new construction project, which under the current constraints has no hope of getting constructed to support HVAC, re-roofing, and foundations and fire alarm replacements. The only amount that will remain in the Bayside High School project is to cover the costs incurred from the interim agreement. We're on track to remove this project from the CIP one year from now, if that remains the will of the school board. This proposal also shifts the priority school for construction from Prince Sand High School to Williams and, Betty, uh, Williams and Bayside 6. We hired Davenport to assist with cash flows and debt service calculations. During that process, Davenport showed a substantial and steep increase in our debt service requirement to fund larger projects like high schools. We have both the available appropriations and debt service capacity to begin construction on Williams and Bayside 6. Although appropriations are available to have Bayside first, there's not enough debt service capacity. This proposal was designed to allow for Williams and Bayside 6 to be on track to start construction in 2026. However, based upon school board budget discussions, it is not clear that the board would be aligned around that plan. We will use this year to develop a better understanding for next steps related to new construction. For example, the school board will be evaluating the, the design of Williams Bayside 6 at our April 16th school board workshop with the goal to provide guidance related to modifying the size of the current design. We've added language to this page uh, in the CIP that referenced new construction. If you look at the red rectangular box at the very bottom of the page, it's small print, so I'm gonna read it for you. Total project cost slash new construction amount is partly based on 2023 educational specifications. Educational specifications and the associated designs will be reviewed under a separate process with the school board, which may result in a change in the square footage and cost. New construction projects will not go out for bid without school board approval separate from the CIP. This language has also been included in the school board CIP resolution. This shows the proposed funding sources. Paygo is being increased each year and reversion value is being decreased in an attempt to reduce reliance on reversion funds. This is an example of the support Davenport provided. With Williams and Bayside 6 as the next in priority new construction school, we remain below the $15 million debt service threshold until 2029. And in the subsequent years, the exceedance is much smaller than Prince Anne High School is, and it's relatively manageable. And here's the proposed modernization program. When you look at projects not fully funded, so that's the bottom portion of the, of the page, you can see the total project cost to the far right is listed as TBD. This reflects that there are too many variables to make a reasonably accurate calculation, and the program, the computer program, allows you to put TBD in that column. When you look at the projects in the CIP portion that's at the top of the page, we ran into a challenge this year. We can't remove any projects, Bayside High School, for example, because we're still in the process of receiving interagreement invoices when this was developed. So we can't remove it this year, but we remain on track to remove it for next year if that's the will of the board. Given that our projected funding for new construction by year seven is zero, we shared with, that, uh, with you earlier, we don't have any good mathematical projections for when Prince Sand High School or Bayside High School construction states would occur. Combined with more than a decade, uh, a decade long trend of data related to CIP funding, do not, do not appear to be on course to provide additional funding to the CIP. Therefore, lacking any solid data, 2043 was chosen as a construction start for Prince Anne High School and 2056 for Bayside High School. Knowing that date, you can then calculate inflation, 6.2% to 
what we shared with you earlier. And that's why the total project cost reflects those values. We can't put a TBD value in there, which would be more appropriate, quite honestly, but the computer program does not authorize you to put that in there. So I said, as I said earlier, we're on track to remove Bayside High School in next year's proposal. And as I also shared earlier, we'll work with the school board to understand their intentions and priorities related to new construction projects over the course of the next year. So in conclusion, this year's proposed CIP prioritizes maintenance of our aging buildings. We have some work to do with our school board to determine the way forward for new construction. With that, we'll turn it back over to Dr. Roberts. So I appreciate everybody's attention here. We've got uh, two slides left. Um, this slide, you know, Virginia Beach City Public Schools does play a critical role in the future economic growth of the city of Virginia Beach. We do that through five areas. One's workforce development, and many of you are involved in that work. Virginia Beach City Public Schools educates and prepares the future workforce of Virginia Beach. We do this by providing quality education and skills training. The school system helps to ensure that the local workforce is equipped with the knowledge and skills needed to fill current and future job openings in key industries. Attracting businesses. High quality schools are a significant factor for businesses when deciding where to locate or expand. Strong public schools in Virginia Beach attract families to the area, which in turn attract businesses seeking to employ skilled workers and serve a robust consumer market. I hear that one large business just relocated here chose Virginia Beach because of the schools. Innovation and entrepreneurship. Education plays a crucial role in fostering innovation and entrepreneurship. By providing students with a strong, a strong foundation in STEM education and encouraging creativity and critical thinking, Virginia Beach City Public Schools helps to cultivate the next generation of innovators and entrepreneurs who can drive economic growth in the region. Community development. A thriving school system contributes to the overall quality of life in Virginia Beach. Families are more likely to settle in areas with good schools, leading to stable communities increasing property values. This in turn can attract investments in local businesses and infrastructure, further supporting economic growth. And then finally, partnerships with local businesses. Virginia Beach City Public Schools collaborates with local businesses and industries to provide students with real world learning experiences, internships and apprenticeships. These partnerships help students gain valuable skills and insights into various career paths, while also strengthening the ties between the education system and the local economy. Finally, an investment in our schools is an investment in the economic future of this great city. We trust we have illustrated the good work of our school division in preparing our future citizens, and it is essential to our city's continued reputation as a great place to live, work, and educate your children. So I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to share this presentation. We hope you found this helpful as you begin deliberations over the next month or so towards adopting a city budget that best serves the residents and the families of Virginia Beach. At this time, the team is prepared to answer any questions. And we'll start with Chris Rose, and then we're Thank you for the presentation today. Congratulations on all the success you all are having uh, to the staff, to the professional teachers and everyone else. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, my, I have a comment and then just a couple of questions. Um, I'm first um, struggling with the idea that we continue to say a reduction and many of the public have acknowledged that by law we have what's called the lower tax rate which is roughly 92 cents and so um, if we were to adopt a 97 cents that would actually be a 4.28 increase have you do you acknowledge that is true uh crystal maybe just i think we just look at it from the how it generates the revenue and what we receive from budget is how that impacts our local revenue source so while i don't look at it in that respect we just look at that when that rate decreases it decreases the revenue sharing that we get from the city so i've i've asked the manager and i think it just like we're forced at home to budget based on the income that we have, not our tax return or not a potential raise, it may make sense on the city side and the school side to try to budget it at the law rate of 93 and then any increase would actually provide additional funding because the public seems to think that we're cutting funds when in actuality 
there would be an increase based on the law. And, and you can talk to the manager about that. Um, on, I don't know what slide it's on, but it's where you reflect the performance of our schools. Mm -hmm. If you could turn to that one, please. So we're, we are performing at a, at a much higher rate, higher level than a lot of our compete, comp competing school divisions. Um, a concern for me uh, has been if that is the case um, and listening to the presentation today, um, how many of these, and this is kind of rhetorical, but of these uh, went down the same line of the PPA? It's, it's very important. I've heard on Facebook, I've seen comments, I've heard school board members comment, that's water under the bridge, but it was a policy decision. And uh, based on the knowledge and the information you presented here, there was an understanding that it was highly unlikely uh, that we would be able to build these schools. And so of these, I've gone and looked in depth and I'll be making public an email from Steve Ballard where he details uh, his communications. Um, of these, how many of these school districts decided to, to, to enter into a PPE agreement to design 30% of three schools for $16 million? Because those I, are real, real dollars. I don't know that answer. You can get back to us with that. I think the public needs to understand that Many of these uh, school districts, and again, I'm going to make the email public for Mr. Ballard, entered into construction within the last four years, completed schools at far less uh, cost than we were projected. And in Mr. Ballard's email, he identified it was because of the, the desires that we presented, the needs, uh, the additions. PA High School in the email he sent had a $1.5 million line item for electric bus charging station. I didn't even know we had electric buses uh, operating within the school system. So that, that was a highlight. Uh, so the item that you just referred to is on a list that was not, uh, it was not made publicly available. That list was not vetted by staff. So that wasn't a staff request. That was what the contractor put together. We never reached that part in the process because that list, and I call it the Ballard list, it says scalable options. It never reached that point in the process. That was a list that the contractor was putting together uh, that was included that lacks a lot of context and was not vetted by Virginia Beach City Public School staff. Thank you. I believe it was stated that those, the 51 million in plus ups was from the tour that we went around and had the public meetings and when constituents and citizens would say, hey, this is what we would like. I think a lot of the council members participated in those meetings. It would then be added to the, the, uh, the developers list. There's there's a lot of detail in and around why the projected cost uh, for the uh, in their proposal wound up being the amount that it was and why it increased so much over time. An element related to so what you what you're describing for the PPEA, and just for everybody's awareness, the, the uh, school board has already said we are not moving forward and they voted on that. So everything that we're talking about is historical. As it relates to the PPEA, it was an unsolicited PPEA. What that means by process is there is no coordination up front with the schools prior to submitting that PPEA. So what that means is when you enter into the interim agreement and you start going through the design process, there are things that the contractor discovers that weren't included in their original proposal that are, or that are needed to be able to execute the programs of Virginia Beach City Public School. And there's a process that we went through. I think we shared with you before, at least in different contexts, the, um, you referred to the process where we got public input. And there's a perception that we'll, when we get public input, we just accepted uh, everything. So for example, in Bayside High School, there was a request for a planetarium, never made it into the process. There was a request for a waterfall to be included in Bayside High School. There was no waterfall that made it into the original design. So we took the other inputs uh, and those then went through a process and uh, in August of last year, then there was a very small group of senior leaders that were in a room, and the sole objective was what is absolutely required to be able to conduct our programs. So the concept of, hey, there was input that was provided by the public that wasn't really vetted and they got too much, that was all vetted out by a senior leadership group that was talking about what's required in order to be able to do the programming under the values and priorities of Virginia Beach City Public Schools. Thank you, sir. And, and since we're, you mentioned historical, uh, we're performing very well um, in 
in terms of the, the teachers, the students. And I was somewhat surprised again. I know you we want to look past it, but it was a policy decision to enter into that and move forward. And this and this body voted for that fifteen point four million dollars that could have gone to some of, to address the twelve point four shortage uh, that that's been presented today. Um, when we look at um, teacher pay and we look at some of these decisions, uh, Dr. Robertson, um, why would we as a school board and a, as a superintendent uh, look at schools 100,000 square feet larger if we're already performing? Clearly, uh, we're sixth, uh, sixth, fifth in the in best school division in Virginia. Um, because again, I think we could have built at least one school had we not seen such really astronomical numbers. And again, there is some evidence out there that other districts listed here have been able to work with the same builder uh, to construct uh, schools. So that's just a comment. Um, when we look at the adjustment in the CIP uh, in preparation for the retreat, um, our budget director had shared, and I, and I don't think the public's aware, I, I think there's such a heavy burden on the, on the residential tax base they're seeing really significant increases. Many of my council members are receiving emails, $100,000 in land. Um, and many of these individuals are retired, older, they don't have children in the school system. I think it's important, again, to understand that you all are setting the policy. We, we give you the money, you set the policy, you decide what you wanna do with it. Uh, in fiscal year 2022 and 23, or 21, 22, $54 million in reversion funds, much of, was because of a surplus or an increase in the tax base real estate assessments. Um, 34 million was sent back to you guys in local funding, zero was state and zero was federal. And so I want the public to understand that this is money that you could have decided could go to construction, you could have decided it could go to maintenance and those were decisions, you, and I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, if it could have went to teacher pay. Uh, in 2022-23, we approved 48 million, um, and of that, uh, five million was state and zero was federal. So we're looking at $69 million because of, uh, as you stated, we have the, call, the highest cost of living. And so for our residents, I think it's important. They're, they're chipping in, they're, they're, you know, they're fully invested, um, but I think at the end of the day, people have to understand that you all are setting the policy, you are making decisions, and, um, you know, we're in a tough place, but I don't support, uh, I'm not going to support the two cents or the 4.5 cents increase. I think we can do better. Um, and I would like to see, I hear so many people uh, talk about tourism and how it saves taxpayers money. But when I look at the revenues, and I look at what's supporting your almost $580 million of personnel, it's the residential taxpayers. So I would challenge um this council to let's utilize tip let's u utilize the resources that are coming in from tourism uh, instead of putting so much burden on the residential because ultimately they come they enjoy our city they tear up our roads and they go um, and we have plenty of money uh, our city manager has proposed 60 million uh, for rudy loop let's take that 60 million and invest in raising the teacher pay i support starting our every teacher at sixty seven thousand dollars we could do that with that 60 million potentially. Um, let's, I've heard from tenured teachers uh, that have been 20 years, 25 years in the school system and they don't feel they're at the top of their pay. So maybe we can look at some of these policy decisions on our end, tap into the tourism bubble that everyone uh, seems to be <laughs> saving so, so much money for our residential taxpayers. And then we can make these teachers whole because in looking at these three uh, items, all of them are low. Um, I mean, we, we can do better. So Councilman Taylor, District 8 supports no Rudy. Let's invest in the teachers. Minimum pay 67,000. Let's work together. And maybe instead of designing schools 100,000 square feet larger than they need to be, maybe we look at what our priorities should be. Thank you. Okay, Rosemary, then Jennifer. Um, thank you for being here. And uh, budget time is always a tough time for all of us. Uh, so the state has passed their budget, and I understand the governor hasn't signed it as of yet. But it, it's my understanding that in new money for schools, it's like two and a half billion dollars. How much of that would be for Virginia Beach City? 
Crystal. So the calculation tool came from Virginia Beach Department of Education late yesterday afternoon. We've done a brief analysis of that. Um, right now, overall, it's about $17 million um, that's coming out of the conference committee report prior to the governor's approval. So we may be getting an additional $17 million from the state if the governor signs this bill. If, it's, if it stands as it is right now, and part of that um, 17 million is dedicated, so not all of that could say be used for compensation. Probably about 11 million of it we've looked at briefly could be used at, for compensation. The remaining of it is very tied to specific activities that we would have to do. And what is the expected, I, I understand that your, your costs are pretty much same each month because most of it's personnel costs. And so when you write your checks each month, it's, it's pretty steady. So you can foresee a lot of how your budget's going, and it's, it's March. Um, what are you expecting the reversion funds to be for this, this year? So we are in the process of doing that at this point, so I don't have a final figure. We are doing projections, as you indicated. We know that based on the current approved CIP program, 10.5 million is actually, if that's available at the end of reversion, will come out of, um, it will go into CIP because that's the way we approved it. But I don't have a final reversion completely projected at this point. I, I didn't expect you'd have a final. I thought you might have a general idea. We're just still in the, we're just that we just started that process and we're hoping to know in the next few weeks. For the last two years, it's been hovering around $50 million. We try, well, while 50 million is part of, is also includes what the city revenue sharing formula comes in over. It's not just the school operating what's appropriated. I understand. Yeah, that. so normally, and we've, we've we said this before, we try to keep up, we try to stay at a 2%. Um, for being physically conservative and based on prior years, and uh, many of you are aware of the deficit that occurred many years ago. And so we practice trying to stay within that 2% reserve in case anything happens when we get to the end of the fiscal year so that we don't have any problems. So last year, I mean, we, this council really stepped up for education. Mm -hmm. And with the step and all, I think that most of your employees got about a 9.5% raise. So that's an average, it's not per employee. So when the step scales were redone based on the consultants because they have not been looked at in a while and they needed to be redone to fix compression and those kinds of things, and I wasn't in the weeds on that, so I'm generalizing. So it wasn't every employee received that kind of, kind of pay. There's some folks that received barely 2%, and there's some folks, depending on where they fell into the scale and when they became employed, whether they might have gotten a much higher percentage. So average across the division was around a little over 8%, I believe, but it was not per employee. I think that we approved 8.5% in, in our budget for schools last year. So, I mean, I think we were really hopeful that that was going to really put us in a better position with teacher salaries. So I know you did the master's degree. Um, what is the starting, where do we stand with starting salaries? We're sixth out of seventh. Now, well, going into next year, what the local divisions are projecting in terms of their increase in starting salary and their increase in compensation will be sixth out of seven starting salary as Ms. Pate alluded to earlier, next year. We had moved all the way up to number two thanks to the work of the board and the council last year. But that's all wiped away with the 7% Portsmouth's given, the 4% Chesapeake's given, the 8% that Norfolk is given, and et cetera. That's what they're projected, but they're not, they're, but they haven't passed their budget yet either. No, that's correct. They have not passed their budget. Thank that's you correct. so much. Hey, Jennifer. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you all for coming for the presentation. Uh, for the sake of the public and the people in the room, just wanted to share the numbers that we got as part of the earlier um, scenario about teacher pay. So we have three offer letters, one from the city of Norfolk, one from the city of Chesapeake, one from the city of Virginia Beach. Um, so with a master's degree in education um, or a master's degree broadly, 
Um, Norfolk is offering $61,000. Chesapeake is offering $58,685. Virginia Beach is offering $56,270. So just for those, for the public who's paying attention and following along. And then not really a question, more of a, uh, for both bodies, both the city council and also for school board. I want to uh, express a frustration that I've been observing particularly around completion. So I view, and I know many at this table view, if not everybody, public education is one of our biggest public investments. So it's deserving of our resources because it's for all the reasons you've indicated. And other public investments are things like our roads and things that public safety that uh, residents, if they are going to be paying a lot of taxes, want to see some sort of return on it. So, you know, I'm thinking about Bayside High School and there's all this energy and, you know, perhaps the students and the teachers and the principals are excited over getting a new building just to now get to a point of, well, maybe not. And I don't think that's acceptable. And so I being new to government, one of my frustrations is why does it take things so long? Like once you have something in the CIP or once you have something, why can't we see it through? And that's probably a broader discussion that we don't have to really like hash out right now. But I do just want to uh, throw that out there that since we're together here, that we, we've got to see this stuff through. Once we put something in, particularly if it's benefiting the public in this way, we, we have to be able to finish things once we started. Thank you. Okay, Josh. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Robertson, thank you. To you and your team. And to the members of the school board, congratulations on uh, a unanimous budget. Um, we come close. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, we, we don't get you in front of us very often. And I just wanted to take an opportunity, like um, I believe one of my colleagues, or at least a couple of them did, just to express my appreciation for our teachers and um, the great work they do. I mean, they are teaching in a changed world, um, especially over the last five years. So, um, and the same is true for the, you know, all the staff and the cafeteria workers and the janitors <coughs> and the, all the people who show such kindness. I know to my daughters on a daily basis um, when they go to school um, and our school resource officers and the people who help our kids cross safely in the streets in the morning. So um, I, I just wanted to, I wanted to acknowledge all those folks and, and like I said, thank you. Um, I, I have two questions for you. Um, one of them is about the interim uh, agreement for the new um, we, we, The way it was communicated to us uh, when, we, um, when we approved the, the uh, entry into the interim design was that um, those designs would still be good for use later. Um, and I know <coughs> there, there weren't necessarily the, um, I guess the amount of scalability um, and the cost savings that, that I think you know, the, the school board was looking for. Um, and, and I understand that, that uh, you know, we're not moving forward with that, but um, are those designs still of use? And um, they were 30% designs, correct? Correct. They were uh, as intended by the interim agreement, the 30% designs, and they were designed around being able to have the contractor develop a guaranteed maximum price. But in order to be able to do that effectively, they're they're beyond thirty percent. But um, it's a, the stated goal was thirty percent design. So are they still of use? They are one hundred percent of use. For example, like I mentioned earlier in the brief, we're going to be going back to the school board for what's the what is proposed to be the priority school in there for Williams Bayside Six to be able to have a discussion related to uh, how can we continue to make improvements on the size and the design of the school. Um, for that school. Well, I'm glad you mentioned size because um, I know I know the square footage was significantly larger than the existing buildings. Um, and I've made this point before around the table, but I'd like to make it again. Um, always comprise about what, 30% of a building-ish? It's fair. Uh, I don't have that detail, but it- I've asked, so that's about right. Sounds, yeah. sounds good. Um, so I, I, um, I, I've been in, Bayside High School, as I know many other uh, council members have been in, in high schools in their district, um, they've taken the lockers down off the wall um, because kids don't need lockers. They don't have there's not any textbooks these days, and they everybody goes to school with a computer. So, um, and and they need that 
you know, space for collaboration space. And, and frankly, just for space to get through the hallway, I stood, um, you know, I stood in, in between classes and it is, um, it is very crowded um, at Bayside High School. And I'm sure the same is true for other schools. So when we think about square footage, um, I just, I just want, I want my colleagues, I, I want the public to understand that this, this, this isn't just fluff. These are, um, you know, hallways are functional and safety um, is paramount in our schools, especially in an emergency uh, when when kids need to be all moving in one direction at one time. So I, I just, um, I want to make that point. Um, now I have a question for you um, because I was looking through your um, CIP um, and, and something jumped out at me that, that didn't look right. Um, and I had a question for you about it. Um, I know you have roughly 87 buildings, is that right? Yes, 86. Um, and, and I've seen, I, I see that you budgeted over the next six years anywhere between 25 and $34 million a year for HVAC. Um, I believe the city has roughly 480 buildings and we've budgeted two and a half million dollars over the each of the next six years of our CIP for uh, for our HVAC needs. And granted, there are little onesie twosie projects here and there that are significant, like our central plant um, CIP project. But to me, that is a very very large difference. And if we are struggling on um, building replacements and we're seeing schools that don't even that, that have TBDs that are going to probably be 190 years old before they're replaced. And I remember reading an article that focused on this issue in the pilot back in 2019. Where have we been on this, and what are we going to do about it? Because um, we 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 we're already behind. We're getting even further behind. So I, I just my math, and I I, I don't want to get into your dollars and cents, but if you took one or two of those years of that $30 million, it would seem to me like you could get to where you needed to get on Princess Anne High School. Um, obviously, Bayside High School has a long way to go, but um, I'm just help me understand that because that is a really big difference between 2.5 and 30 million. Uh, yes, and the, the, to walk you through the detail related to uh, those two values, um, would be uh, really beyond the scope of what we can do here. So I can tell you, and I'm trying to get to the slide where we, we have those uh, numbers are based on assessments of our, uh, of our HVAC systems. So that slide right there. That's what you can see there in red is those are uh, unsatisfactory, on the verge of failing. We're keeping them together. Um, in critical situations, and we see those. We see that happen on uh, unusually hot days. Um, we, we start to get concerned about the learning environment in the classroom related to our HVAC systems with uh, failures that, that they can occur when they're stressed. Something that's also uh, good for everybody to know, and certainly for, for me, coming from uh, not coming from the school division background and coming into it, um, we have a substantial amount of programming over the summer. And uh, so on average, we have about 250 buses that transport kids to programs over the course of every day over the summer. And when I say every day, I'm talking about Monday through Thursday. So we're also using those buildings in the summertime, the, the peak portion of the heat. So fully acknowledge the difference that you see in those two. I would like to further understand the difference in those two. The numbers that you see here are based on assessments that we've done of those systems and where we fall uh, related to their condition. Um, so we'll, we'll continue to work with you and get you the best information that we have. I appreciate that. I appreciate that because I know our, our buildings are open during the summer too. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, <laughs> and thank you very much. Absolutely. Hey, Barbara. Uh, I noticed on one of your slides, you indicate that you reduce the health care premiums for staff by 40 to 50% and that you've implemented the largest employee compensation package. Can you describe your compensation package? I noticed you didn't mention this in your yeah, offer letter. Yeah, yes, ma'am. That was um, from last year, and that was, a again, uh, that <laughs> partnership opportunity that the, board, that the board and council had last year that was able to identify those funds and use those funds for the compensation package. 
that we provided to staff last year and through negotiations with Mercer, we were able to also lower the the health cost. That was all things that occurred last year. Yes, ma'am. Where does that stand now? I mean, what are you offering? Right, right now, the only thing that we have built in our budget is a step increase for staff, 1.5 percent for. You don't have anything in your budget for benefits. So we just have the 3% employer contribution. There's nothing for the employees. And so it's just as similar to the, what the city is proposing. So you, but I think the city's proposal is that we, we would not be increasing the health care cost. Councilman Bradley, I think this year the school's taking the same stance. As previously, I think the schools have reduced down the employee premiums to 50% to be more competitive in the school teacher market. This year, I think they're taking the same stance as us, whereas they're not doing any employee increase, but but they're also doing a 3% increase on the on the school side. So I think we're on the same page this fiscal year, where employees will not see an increase in their health premiums. I but would like to see the, two, the city and the schools compared to see you know, what you are offering and what the city is offering, so we see how they relate. Okay, we'll get that to you. It's roughly 50%. I think they're 50% lower than the city, but we'll make sure we get that information to you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Amelia and then Hutch. Again, thank you so much. As you know, I am a teacher, professor, so education, I mean, is key. And we cannot uh, compromise on that. So a um, couple of things I jotted down as you all went through this. Um, Loss of buying power is a reality. Inflation is a reality. And we have to look at it, not just the school, but all around. Um, the maintenance need, and I'm glad um, you shared a little bit from uh, Councilman uh, I went into Betty F. Williams. And walking along and noticed the flooring and noticed the rug. And I said, why in one spot you have this rug? He says, well, there may be something else beneath that. So we try to put that for the health. So you're very concerned about the health and welfare of our students, which is um, commendable. I noticed where you talked about ESSA, the do inflationaries and required expenses that you go over and above what they do for regular classes, which makes our students top notch. And that's an extra expense. That is very important. I wrote down about the pay for teachers and staff relating to the loss of buying power and inflation. We'll be looking at that. Um, very important to me, you saw me clap for that, for the ROI that we give is very impressive. So you do a lot with what you have to make our school shine. And a lot of people come to Virginia Beach because of the schools, just like you're saying, even the businesses. I can say in District 4, we're getting more and more coming in there because of our school system. Um, to do with Bayside, Sorry about what's going on for that, but at least trying to save um, the highest, the sixth grade campus and the Betty F. Williams is very important. But you've left us with a lot to look at, and it will not go on deaf ears. Thank you. Thank you, Hutch. Hey, thank you, sir. Uh, hey, so it's my first time on this side of the table, as I've said a couple times. Um, so I have some just clarifying questions for me, and I think I think a lot of times what I bring on stuff like this is sometimes the acronyms we use we don't all understand, right. and I think anybody that's watching falls into my place a lot of times. So, um, so I'm gonna ask just a couple of questions to help me understand some stuff. When we and it's been around the table a couple of times here, and then and y'all have talked about it, and, and uh, Councilman Schulman just sort of mentioned it too. But so when we talk about decrease in students. You know, if we lose three students, that's a decrease. Are, are we talking about numbers that are going to matter? Like, can y'all project that? Like, are we looking at a drop in numbers that is really significant? Is it a blip? 
you know, can you help me understand that a little bit? Yeah, so we've had a slow drip okay. of loss of students over the last several years. That's projected to be a slow drip for another couple of years before we get a, a slight increase. Uh -huh. um, but I will tell you, there is a discussion occurring with our building utilization committee as to whether or not we want to continue. We need to continue to operate 86 assets. Mm -hmm. um, and could we po possibly downsize some assets? Yeah, I'm not asking you. I'm just more just right. getting a clarification. So then <clears throat> could that affect... I think you're saying it could in schools futures it could be enough that you know maybe the lockers are out of the out of there it does make the hallways feel a little bit you know what i'm saying is whatever your building is not trying to get into that sir but is as far as that do you think that could have effect then is it i, I believe what you're yes. saying yes okay. oh absolutely enrollment okay. has an effect programming has an effect yeah. um and uh the other big effect is funding well, right. And so, you know, we are in the process uh, that we'll engage with the board to shrink yeah. some some of our designs of those three facilities to get it down to a more manageable number. So, obviously, we all would appreciate that. But I would also say, you know, picking on our size here a little bit, buddy. But when, when the two of us walk down a hall, I've been down Kimsville and I've been down Princess Anne, and I feel like they're pretty small. You know, it feels kind of tight to me. And I know when the bell rings, it gets really tight, yeah. you know. Um, so I don't know that I, I, I'm just saying we want to be careful with that. I'm right. not asking you to do something. I'm just asking you to right. maybe look at it and where we can, right? I know Kimsville Rec Center did it. I don't know if a lot of people know this, but Kimsville Rec Center is smaller than it was before it was rebuilt because they did do some utilization. It doesn't feel it, but it actually is. So stuff like that, I guess, is what I'm asking. Um, next thing is, uh, and I appreciate uh, Councilman Rouse bringing it up, uh, and because it's going to be a reoccurring theme <laughs> coming here, is uh, pay. Um, obviously, uh, as sort of the public safety guy here, and it's really across all all our employees and our educators. And I, I count us all seventeen, eighteen thousand, whatever it is. Is is that I don't. I don't have, I went to Kimsville, but I don't have all the answers, but I do think we have to ask the questions is what that's going to look like moving forward um, on how we're gonna, how we're gonna fix that. It comes back every year, you know, that, that city employees are, are not, not at the top of the scale. Educators are not at the top of the scale. I mean, I, I, I'm just really tired of hearing it. And I'm tired of being a part of it. Uh, as the fire chief, I was tired of it. I'm not happy about it now. You know, is is that we are the city of Virginia Beach. All these numbers saying where we're number one, I think pay and benefits, we should be there too. From our from our account clerk all the way through to firefighters, police, sanitation, educators, everybody should be in there. But go ahead, ma'am, you have something. And to say. so we agree, we understand that. And and luckily. Fingers crossed. The General Assembly has um, talked about increasing over the next biennium, increasing um, teacher salary to the national average. And that is really where a lot of this is going to begin. And the onus should not be on the city as much as it's to the state. And as Ms. Payton um, mentioned in her presentation, the JLARC study showed that. Unfortunately, the JLARC study was again this year studied, yeah. and so hopefully we'll see some serious movement. But the General Assembly this year did come out and say their goal is over the next biennium to uh, to to be at the national average. Just for again for our TV viewers and everybody, JLARC. I was part of some with the, being on the state chiefs and all that. It's a joint legislative and review committee. It's something they did. They do a very thorough. They're wonderful when they do their work. And they have come up with some looks like some good stuff for y'all as well. But it takes a couple of years to get through the process. And that's where we are there. And if I may, um, Councilman, um, to your last question, while we have seen a decrease in enrollment, a drip, as Dr. Yeah. Robertson pointed out, yeah. um, our needs have increased for our students. And so one of the slides you probably saw an increase in special education. We, we have nearly 9,000 students that are receiving special education services. Um, I know through the workforce development um, work that Councilwoman um, 
uh, Wilson was doing with uh, Mrs. Weems, there's been an increase. Um, they, they'd like an increase in, um, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, C, uh, TCE. Yeah, I'm sorry. TCE. And so if you look at the TCE. technical career education, yeah. sorry about that. Yeah, um, right. yeah, and so that's a presence that people would like to see in our buildings, which was part of the reason Princess Anne was, was larger, because they've asked for that presence in these buildings to expand sure. that within our, um, in our system. And so student, student needs have changed, education has changed, um, and we are trying to adjust to all of that. And then through construction, having to now fit that into our building structure. Well, I think you've hit on a couple things here that I'm trying to get to is, is that one way we can stop the drip on that is, is if we increase our pay. We do have some big companies coming, have some things happen where we want people moving into the city and not out of the city. And that starts with education, pay, and mental health. That's what you're talking about when you're talking about the special needs, right? I mean, that's where we're... I mean, that plays a role, yeah. yes, but so, I'm ta I was talking specifically special education and students yeah. who qualify for that service. Any of those nature, however you want to mm -hmm. cloak that, you know, or put that in. So just a, one or two more things, sir. Um, so one of the things, though, that I think is clear here is, is that and, and I give our budget director who's sitting over there uh, a lot of kudos on how he brings us this stuff. And it's also probably because we're more comfortable with it, although I wasn't here, I was over there for 10 years. So I'm very comfortable with the way it's presented, is, is that I do think there, it's gotta be more collaboration you know, on these things. Uh, and, I, and sir, I know you've said it as far as having us there, and I know I've spoken to enough of us, we're all in on that. The more we communicate, the better off we'll be. Um, I'm coming up for election again this year, but I plan on being sitting here next year, and I'm going to really push that we do more of this, uh, not not all in the limelight. Some of it just needs to be working in small groups. You know, the fire department, we break bread together. We, we learn about each other a little bit more, so there's no surprises. And we know that the revision, it may be $10 million your way, but our way, it's $50 million. So what, what it, like right now, I don't understand the difference. What Can somebody tell me what why it's $10 million and as, as the vice mayor said, we're saying 50 million the last two years. Uh, Mr. Doheny, you want to tackle that one? Councilmember Hutchinson, I love if our reversion was that much. It's usually, yes. usually sometimes the other way around where they usually sometimes have more than us. It ebbs and flows some years depending okay. on um, what the overperformance of revenue, but also the years that they overperformed that we really overperformed was really the COVID years when we had a lot of federal dollars that we got from Co from CARES Act and American Rescue Plan Act. And also there was just a whole bunch of underperformance. I think we're stabilizing now. I don't think you're going to see that tremendous amount of, um, of overperformance on the city side. Schools, I can't necessarily speak to them, but I think they're kind of plateauing as well. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks so much. That's it for me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Sabrina and Worth. So um, I wanted to talk about uh, just a couple of things real briefly. Um, first, you know, just an observation looking at uh, the proposed FY24-25 CIP slide that you put up about school modernization and replacement. And just, you know, just wondering, just, well, just, just a thought. You know, Bayside, as we've mentioned, uh, certainly is in dire need as well as the other schools that are listed here, but I'm just picking one, Bayside. Uh, it's, it's already in dire needs of attention. Uh, and when you look at the construction completion date, um, I would say uh, about six years ago, when I ran for re-election, or well, when I ran for election, young lady from Bayside pulled me aside and said, Ms. Wooten, you need to come visit our school. You have to see it. It's in terrible, in a terrible situation. Um, you should see what we have to go through. And I've been there and I've, I've seen it. And so that was six years ago. <coughs> the completion or construction completion for that school is 2059. And that's about 35 years down the road. And so my, my thought is just, you know, with that timetable and understanding where that school is now with as well as the rest of them, it's just concerning, you know, uh, 
what happens during that 35 year period um, when things just become uh, really, uh, I guess, really disastrous in the point of uh, the, the school, the infrastructure. And so that, that's just a thought that I think about. And also in terms of how we mitigate that for the students, you know, because the students also, we have to understand, have to go day in and day out to these schools that need to be replaced. Uh, and so I think about that. That's just a thought. Um, the other uh, matter I wanted to bring up, uh, I'll just say in terms of uh, growth in our schools, I think uh, when we talk about the schools and growth, we should actually, as we look down at the future, understand that there is potential for our city to grow. There is potential for families to continue to grow. I just heard the other day uh, about a study that showed that folks are looking to migrate to Virginia Beach. Uh, and so sometimes I think we're short-sighted in terms of growth. Um, there is going to be growth. Down the line in the next, you know, third, I'd say 10, 20, 30 years down the line, we're going to see some potential and I'm, I'm going to say some significant growth in our city. Uh, that's just the future of Virginia Beach. And so we have to really look at our schools and plan uh, for the future and uh, not be short sighted that, hey, this is where we are. We're going to stay. But look at the bigger picture. Uh, the last thing I would say, uh, Dr. Robertson, you hit it, the nail on the head. Um, I hear it all the time where um, many folks uh, brag about Virginia Beach and the school, the education is so great, and folks move here, uh, businesses move here. Uh, I, I hear it in the state of the city all the time. I hear it in other uh, presentations about uh, our city, how great education is. Uh, I mentioned it last night, I was at a forum. But I think what we're lacking is, and this is in terms of CIP as well, if we uh, know that, and it is a fact, what we should do is make sure that fact aligns with our priorities. We oftentimes see things fast-tracked uh, when there is a desire to do so and um, competing interests behind the scenes. Well, if you think, and we know it's a fact, Virginia Beach school systems are, one, are some of the best uh, in this country. So let's take that fact and make, as a body, uh, funding schools a priority, replacing schools, maintaining schools. Uh, and that comes from leadership. You have to make it a priority. Um, oftentimes, you can hear about you know, the things that need to happen, CIPs need to happen, but you got to make it a priority. Once you make it a priority, you will see progress. But until we make it a priority consistently, you won't see the progress that you need. Thank you. Good work. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Dr. Robertson, Chairman Melnick, Ms. Pate, um, Mr. Freeman, thank you for the presentation and the hard work. I know a lot of hours go into this. So an observation and then a question. The observation, can you go back, Dr. Robertson, to the SOLs and the grid, how Virginia Beach compares with Fairfax, Loudoun, Henrico, so my observation is um, we heard earlier about our, what we pay our teachers starting and the competing offers with Norfolk and Chesapeake. But look what our teachers have done. We are at the top in the state, even though we are below uh, our comp comparable cities here in the region. So I just want to shout out to teachers and everyone that supports the teachers. Councilman Shulman said, I know Chairman Mellick and Ms. Anderson here, school board are uh, ex-teachers or are teachers now. So those are really important because when you look at funding, do you put money into, into schools or do you put money into teachers? I know the balance, but I've always believed that teachers carry the day with me. Um, so that observation, um, can you go to the JLAR because it leads to the second part of it, and that's the question if we, because I've seen JLARC studies now for a number of years, for decades, where 
We in the state of Virginia and also here in Virginia Beach and the region are below the national average. That's the national average. So what does it take to get to um, the, the national average and in our city comparing to others around the region? What, how much more in teacher pay? Do we know that? So <clears throat> I don't have that exact dollar amount. I would offer an opinion about that. Okay, yeah, that's, yeah. So as you all know, uh, the average and being a former math teacher can be used inappropriately. And I think the national average is kind of an inappropriate data point because the cost of living in New York City versus the cost of living in Mississippi versus Florida versus California. I, I have a teacher friend in California who lives an hour outside of San Diego and makes $120,000 a year as a teacher. But his house in San Diego costs a million dollars. So I think the average is a little skewed. Um, I think there's a general agreement that the work that teachers are doing now, they're underpaid. But worse, they're underappreciated. And I think, you know, the national rhetoric around public education is hurt. Teachers are doing great work. They need to be lifted up for that. They were champions for six months or six weeks out when COVID started. And then all of a sudden it went away. Um, so I would offer that about the national average. But certainly the state has indicated that 7% over the biennium was about what it would take. And just a follow-up comment, because when we do look at what we did last year, I believe it's Vice Mayor Wilson said 85 to 9%. 5% of that was the state. So other localities around the, the state and the, and the region here got the same. So it's so what did we as a city do? And as we deliberate the budget, you know, the budget does reflect our values as, as council members and as a city. How much do we put into public education? How much we put into public safety? 60 million for Rudy Loop, but 4.1 cents on the, the mill rate goes to stormwater bond referendum. So there's a lot of gives and takes and needs out there. So I just, we just need to look at public, supporting public ed education, especially teachers. Okay, thank you all. And, uh, you know, folks, I want to thank you for coming. You know, obviously, this is our first step in our confrontation with reality that we're going to be having, you know, from this day forward, not only with uh, you distinguished colleagues, but as we go forward with deliberations, other things. You know, whether we like it or not, so, you know, some things are just out of our control. And I, I can almost guarantee that every city, township, village, and hamlet is going through the same exercise, you know, that we're going through. You know, once again, at the risk of repeating myself, you know, coming out of COVID, compounded with inflation, you know, just so we know that our bond referendum, which was over a half a billion dollars, the same projects cost a billion. When we talk about the capital projects of school modernization and replacement, and not only our number of buildings that we have, our road infrastructures, our sewer infrastructures, you know, we're confronting a, a future of billions of dollars in obligations that we haven't figured out a way to pay for yeah. yet. And the way to do that is that we're going to have to be creative and, you know, and, uh, you know, increase our revenue sources because obviously we can't really go to the well anymore uh, than we are. And, you know, the other thing is, too, um, you know, um, you know, government budgeting is a dynamic um flow and you know we never know what's going to happen what the state's going to give us it changes year to year our priorities change for year to year and once again as i mentioned you know we were on track back in i think it was 2016 with a number of cip projects i want to address what you know, jennifer's concern but then when we got hit with you know, hurricane matthew we had to do a pivot and shift and we went from a nine percent of our cip uh, you know, uh, went, it went to 15 percent, 25 percent, 25 percent, 25 percent of our C CIP changed with the stormwater. Yeah. And, you know, worth is right. We absorbed four and a half cents uh, into that. And had we not done that, you know, uh, we didn't raise taxes. But, you know, once again, you know, the rate would be around 93 cents. And at least the good news is we started uh, the exercise of our budget process examining the uh, would turn out to be detrimental effects of dropping the rate down to, you know, neutral at 92%.
But the other thing is too, and this is what I know also burdens you, it burdens us, is unfunded mandates that are put in. And from what I understand, you know, we did a study about that at Regent University, the impact on especially Virginia Beach schools. You're, you're absorbing unfunded mandates right. is a significant part of your budget and our budget. Right. But once again, you know, we're going to do the best we can. We're dealing with the cards that are dealt with us. But once again, as you know, Hutch said, you know, let's keep the collaboration and communication going. And thank you very much. I know we took a lot of time with this, but I think it was very important and essential. Well, we, and, we really appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Okay, great. Thank you. And Council, at this point, why don't we go ahead and take a five minutes uh, stretch break? And okay.
Council. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Again, thank you to the city manager and Ms. Shelton and her staff, because we could not be here uh, without all of their hard work. So I will be uh, fairly brief uh, this afternoon. Uh, my partner, Kyle Laux, was unable to uh, join us, but uh, rest assured he will be back. Uh, and Austin Sachs, our young and analyst, uh, is with us as well. Um, that said, let me see if I can move along here. Okay. Uh, a little bit of background. Uh, as all of you know, and for the audience, uh, Davenport is the uh, independent financial advisor to the city of Virginia Beach. Uh, as a result of that, we're not here to uh, sell you anything. We're not here to suggest any projects specifically, uh, but rather uh, we are here to help you uh, analyze and ascertain uh, the financial implications of those things that you ask us to look at uh, and then move forward on. Uh, as the city manager indicated, um, we were here just a few months ago in December. Uh, Kyle and I discussed uh, the updated capital improvement program. Uh, one of the things you do an excellent job of with your staff uh, is to think not just for the upcoming year, but for multiple years, five and 10 years out. And as a result of that, uh, we're coming to the point uh, and have recommendations uh, that it is time now uh, to do two financings. Uh, one is what we call the charter or general obligation bond issuance, uh, and the second is the public facility revenue bonds. We talked about those as well as some of your water and sewer bonds and some other things back in December, uh, all of which are done in accordance with your continuing to keep and enjoy the highest credit rating possible, which is AAA. And that's what you have, uh, and that's what we are uh, very convinced that you will continue to have uh, as we go through the rating process uh, to have them uh, hopefully do nothing more than to re-up our AAA ratings, uh, which are a necessary uh, part of getting these bonds issued. And I'll talk about that schedule in a moment. So the environment to head into this uh, is a very favorable one. Um, if you see here on the left-hand side, it's called the 20 bond index. Uh, maybe a little confusing because it's actually over some 40 plus years uh, going back to 1980. So almost, but the 20 bond is just a, an aggregation of, of and effectively uh, bonds issued that are average of 20 year maturities. Uh, and you can see that um, that's when I started uh, in this business in the, in the beginning of 1980, 81, 82. Uh, interest rates for a 20-year fixed rate were almost 14%. Uh, today, uh, the good news is we're under 4%. So we've come a long way. Um, on the right-hand side, we go back several years, not quite, and I don't think we'll get back to those uh, unbelievably low interest rates during, uh, you know, sort of the, the real impact of the COVID years. Uh, where we were looking at something uh, in the 2% range. Uh, hard to, to think of that. Um, but nevertheless, we're in a very strong environment. Um, I will tell you, when we do our planning for you, we plan at 5% and thereabouts. Uh, and we expect, again, things could change, but we think we're going to be closer to about 3.5% fixed rate for the financings coming up. So that said, let's, let's focus for the moment on the first uh, tranche of bonds. That's the, we call it the charter or the general obligation bonds. Um, and a lot of this is to reimburse uh, the city coffers. Um, again, you've got a very sophisticated staff that does a very good job of really knowing uh, when to, in effect, take money down from the credit markets uh, because, again, uh, all these projects have been approved by you uh, and we're moving forward. And you can see there, uh, here in the general obligation, uh, it covers a variety of projects, but especially, um, you'll notice in the middle, almost about $120 million of your flood CIP projects. And I think that's important because one thing, again, you've done a good job of, a very good job of, 
I think, is to understand all these flood issues for coastal cities. As a result of that, here you are following your plan and you're, in effect, getting going on the borrowing component of that. Uh, and that's why that $118 million is part of that roughly $275 million that we are looking at uh, for uh, this, this spring, and I'll show you the schedule. So on the second part of that, the second tranche, if you would, that's that public facility revenue bonds. Um, and again, those uh, primarily, the funding is coming uh, from the TIP program, the Tourism Investment Program. Uh, and again, a lot of that is going towards um, the Atlantic Park project. So a little bit of schools, and I should have said also in the general fund side, that other bond structure, some school as well. Not a lot, but again, part of the overall plan. So again, both of these uh, bond financings will have some schools in them, uh, but some of this is tied into what is uh, legally allowed, going back to your charter in the 1960s, the early 1960s. So that's how we, why we in part set these up the way they are, or you've set these up the way they are. So let's talk a little bit, as I said, about uh, good favorable interest rates. Um, if those favorable interest rates continue, we will actually be able to refund some of the outstanding debt. Those of you in the audience and those of you, again, around the table, when we talk about refundings, that's a good thing. All we're talking about, is think of it this way, of a mortgage, is exchanging current interest rates for lower interest rates. We are not pushing out the principal at all. We are just, ex we, again, just an exchange, if you would, of let's say if you have a mortgage and you're fortunate, and that's at 6 or 7%, think of this as going to 4 or 5%. Same general concept here. Now, what we have as a city in that second green box, if you would, is we actually have a policy, self-imposed, that basically says anything above a 3% net present value is something that, uh, short of some unique circumstances, uh, is warranted, is considered a viable uh, and market-driven acceptable refinancing. And so for the moment, uh, the general obligation bonds, there's about 54 million that have been identified, and there's about 30 million in the public facility revenue bonds. So potentially, collectively, uh, we could be talking of something uh, close to 80, 90 million dollars that could be refunded. Uh, and again, we would love to be coming back to you on a regular basis to talk about further refundings. What that simply means is that interest rates and markets are favorable. Uh, and all of this, by the way, is fixed rate. None of this involves, uh, from our world, variable rates or anything of a swap nature that you may have heard about. We feel like this is uh, tried and true uh, and as safe as we can get. So uh, next steps, um, we're here today, uh, March 26th, again, just purely educational purposes. Um, and then uh, a couple weeks from now on the 16th of April, um, we're asking you to uh, formally consider uh, the appropriate uh, resolutions. Um, the public hearings effectively, when you did last year's budget, that effectively covered uh, these bonds that you're going to, uh, to do. Uh, and that's because, again, uh, that was all covered by the public in your approved multi-year capital improvement program. Um, we're, we're thinking uh, we've got dates set up to have uh, calls with the rating agencies. There are three of them, uh, Moody's, Standard & Poor's, and Fitch, uh, the week of April 15th. So, on and around that time that uh, we're having that resolutions approved, and those are developed by your bond council and reviewed by your city, uh, city attorney. Uh, we would then move forward after those ratings, and we're looking at the sale dates sort of middle of May uh, with the closing sometime uh, of about a month later. So uh, all of this designed to uh, try and our best to get it done and put it to bed 
by the end of the fiscal year, of course, which ends June 30th. So with that, before I, I touch on some timing of, of anything in terms of uh, amortization, meaning how long bond issues can be, um, happy to answer any questions or maybe any anything I should clarify. Point. Talking about refinancing, doing different things like we've done with our houses and all, <clears throat> and I applaud keeping it the date the same, right? The end date. Uh, is there there is like with your houses? Is there charges that go along with that? Like, are we paying to do that? Yes, sir. So what we um, are excited about is we believe that if we can do this simultaneous with the financings, yeah. we get the economies of scale. So sure. we're not going to have to go and have whole separate payments to do that. Now, <coughs> let's assume uh, that we recommend moving forward. That's only because that 3% or higher, that includes any additional underwriting costs right. that are there. Um, and when I say underwriting costs, we're not your underwriter. It's not our costs. But what happens is we are going to set these financings up, we call them competitively. And what that simply means is that we will put it out into the marketplace at roughly, say, 11 o'clock on a Tuesday or Wednesday morning. Anybody and everybody that's bona fide, pre-approved, banking institutions, high net worth, um, can, can bid on this. It's an all or nothing. Uh, they have to be willing to buy all of it, including the refunding. Um, and that's how that works. Okay. So um, we, will, we, we won't know what the exact cost of even the new money are, right. but when I gave you that sense of roughly 3.5%, that's already sort of embedded in the marketplace. Okay. Um, so that's how it works. Thank you. Okay. okay first. Hello, sir. Thank you for the presentation. Um, you mentioned the 156 is pretty much all Atlantic Park or a majority. Yes, sir. And then... Um, and that's for the public, two parking garages and an event space. That's on our side, Patrick. I will, I will defer to our staff. Yes, sir. That's for the uh, music venue and the parking garage and then probably some of the off-site later work. So some of the off-site. So it's like a data set I misspoke, so data's going to come and correct All me. Right. Thank you. Right. <laughs> Big project. Yep. <clears throat> Sorry about that, Council Member Taylor, but... It, yeah. It's a mostly true statement. It also includes the purchase of the Dairy Queen property. Okay. So the tip fund characterization is correct, but it is not just that Atlantic Park. It includes that. Uh, 13 million, uh, 12. Yes, correct. Okay. And so um, we are getting ready to go into budget discussions. Um, just in the manager's proposed, we have 24 million additional because this is not anything related to what we may do. This is just as of today, right? In terms of the 156 million, I'm not trying to follow council. So the bonds here, uh, 2024 public facility bonds. This has nothing to do with what we may adopt in this in our budget. Correct. Okay. Because uh, in the proposed budget, we have. Well, go. I was like, it, it, Eric, let me think. It does yeah. have. You you want to speak to that, Kevin? I think what we do here will be paying for with. The debt service in the next that, that's correct yeah uh, yes sir so council member if i understood the question correctly the sizing of this issuance um you were just wanting to double check that this doesn't have anything to do with the proposed budget as put forward for city council's consideration regarding the financing of the cip for instance in the cip for tip we have roughly 24 million for atlantic avenue you have rudy 60 million and i think there's a few other projects correct with the, the those, included. Th those are programmed in the out years to be appropriated by city council. So the city's long used the practice of reimbursing ourselves uh, on bond issuances. So uh, the um, projects that are being reflected here and being sized up for this issuances are reflective of expenditures and project spend that's already happened to date based on previous appropriations. So nothing is being um, forward issued within the TIP fund, my understanding, um, within the uh, the upcoming bond issuance. Does that answer your question? Yes, and I'm, I'm going somewhere. So a lot of times we hear this is tried and true. It's, you know, these are great projects, but we don't often look at the risks. So from your standpoint in Davenport, um, you know, let's say this $140 million uh, 
or Atlantic Park um, fall short in terms of performance. When I'm, when I'm looking at these debt payments, um, it doesn't, with, that may not even meet our debt service. And so how do we play, how does that play into kind of this discussion? The bill payer for the debt service associated with the Atlantic Park project um, is the TIP fund itself. The existing dedications that are within the TIP fund and the forecast of projection <coughs> forward-looking estimates of revenue within the TIP fund are anticipated to be able to cover the debt service associated with this. That does not, and projections are conservative in this regard, none of the fiscal impact estimates associated with that development are embedded within the revenue projections of the TIP fund, meaning that the TIP fund will be able to, is projected to be able to cover this debt service through baseline existing um, natural growth revenues as they exist today. Based on the current dedications. Based on current dedications, yes, sir. Thank you. Anyone else at this point? Okay. Sorry. Thank you, Kevin. Um, what I'd like to do, Mayor, is just turn now to uh, uh, the question that we were asked to address, it won't take very long, uh, and then we'll be done. Uh, and that is, um, there was some discussion uh, about whether or not uh, the city uh, could and should consider uh, debt being amortized beyond 20 years. Uh, 30 years, it could certainly go longer. So what we simply put together here, um, it's a lot of words on a page, but basically, I uh, wanted just to give you uh, some of the, the credit positives, the credit challenges um, of 20 versus 30 year financing. So let me, let me take a step back for a moment and just say this. Um, historically, traditionally, uh, strong cities like yourself that are robust, that are growing and have been growing, um, we found that the practice that you currently have, which is to do with certain exceptions, 20-year uh, amortization of what we call level, primary level principle, meaning the same amount of principle every year for 20 years. Think of it this way. If you have a $20 million borrowing, that means you're going to basically pay off a million dollars every year for 12, for 20 years. So that's what we mean by level. Uh, typically, we borrow money for a home. It's called level uh Payments. We will pay less principal in the early years, more principal in the latter years, but have the same payments. Having said that, um, the city has put itself in a position so that uh, it can take on uh, considerable debt over the next five or ten years. Um, and as you know, because you approved the, the largest uh, referendum, the flood referendum, uh, to take care of all that, you put yourself in a position to be able to layer that in uh, in such a way uh, that we believe, uh, within reason, we can keep our AAA ratings. At the same time, um, that rapid debt payment allows us to layer in uh, a lot of new debt. Obviously, if we were at 30 years, we could layer in more debt, but in reality, uh, that would be good for a few years, and what it would really do then is hamstring uh, subsequent city councils. So uh, there is the possibility, um, not lost on us, uh, that perhaps there is uh, a certain project or two that maybe we think about going out uh, at 30 years uh, or thereabouts or doing a little more structuring um, to maybe move that up. Uh, but by and large, um, you have put yourself uh, in a very good position. Uh, and you've got a very robust, as you know, uh, CIP, Capital Improvement Program, that includes, again, the borrowing component. So um, with all of that, we also have, as a city, a self-imposed policy uh, for how fast we're going to pay off overall debt. Um, remind me, I think it's at the, is it the 50%? Yeah, so think of it this way. Um, and again, it's because we have so many things over the years, um, we have a policy that says that in 10 years from now, we'll have paid off half of our principal. That's what we call a payout ratio. Um, if you're an individual uh, and fortunate to own a home, the average person pays off about 25% 
of the principal after 10 years. We're at 50%, if not higher. And that is, again, part of why we're able to have a robust capital improvement program. Granted, we can't do everything, as we know, but at the same time, it allows us to do that. And then also where it helps us is it <clears throat> helps us to maximize our AAA ratings. That in turn allows us to have me talk to you about refinancing and saving money. So it's really a loop. And the, and the more that we, we do the right things up front, the better off we seem to be and not seem to be. <coughs> so I'll, I'll stop there, uh, Mayor and members, Council. It's all really we had to say today and happy to answer any other questions uh, if you want me to. Any other questions uh, or thoughts about you know, uh, the 30 years? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, appreciate you um, going through this information with us. Um, I was actually one of the people that asked that we take a look at it, just mm -hmm. keeping in mind what we just heard with our schools. Um, and considering that these buildings are being you know, built to last in excess of 100 years, it kind of got me thinking as to why we're trying to pay them off in 20. So um, I, I would, I, and, and I'm certainly cautious and don't want to um, hamstring our ability to be flexible. Uh, including the, the ability of uh, future councils to um, you know, make necessary and hard choices. But um, I would be interested in knowing whether or not that this would be one of a couple strategies that we could um, evaluate whether or not it would be effective in terms of our school replacements. I think that makes sense. Worth. So thank you, Mayor. Just to follow on question, if that were the case, can you estimate ballpark the higher interest rate is it the loss of the triple um, a credit rating or is it a, a more basis points than the interest rate so I don't know if this is uh, as easy to see on the screen but before we even get to let's say the loss of the triple a um, we put together a comparative here of 20-year level principal in today's environment which is basically below fixed rate below 3.25%. Um, I don't want to come in front of you and say, right now the market's at 3.25, it's not quite there in a month and a half or two when we go to the marketplace. But if we were able to access the market today, we literally would be, because of your credit rating, the structure, we see ourselves borrowing below 3.5%. And that's sort of where we are. So that's part one. But if we go to 30-year level principle, we add about 40 basis points or four, four tenths of 1%, still very, very strong um, to, your, to your point, still a very good interest rate. Um, and then if we go to level debt service, move it all the way to more of a, again, a more graduated scale over years, it's about 375. So still, again, and it's, it's a very compelling thought here. Um, again, I doing this now as long as I have, um, I could be talked into, so to speak, some combination. If there is a specific project or projects that really makes sense, that will not upset the overall apple cart, if you would, of the CIP, um, you know, we would be, uh, would be very much able to, to look at that if that's the, the, the desire of the staff and the council. Um, but nevertheless, again, I, I am a little cautious on the flip side. Because, you know, if you think about it, and correct me if I'm wrong, as I'm not from Virginia Beach, I'm from Richmond, but, you know, I don't know. I mean, even though we knew for decades that, glow, you know, we we're going to have this rising tides and, and coastal, I, I don't know if we thought, let's say, just 20 years ago that we were going to have to do a billion dollars alone just for flood here in the city that we were going to be responsible for, we meaning the city. So that's why I say that the fact that predecessors to us and to all around the table have kind of done that 20 year has allowed us to be in a mode that we're now going to be taking on not only schools and other general capital needs, but also, you know, hitting the flood needs head on. Yes, sir. Patrick and then uh, Mr. Mayor, also just remember all of these um, decision points that we're going to have to make on the, the extra. $400 million for the flood protection program. 
we're all trying to bring this to you all to have a policy discussion in December on how best to handle that, in addition to the CIP retreat where we need to talk about how do we support the CIP, which we can't currently fully afford right now as well. So we're all trying to set up all of these items for you all to have that conversation. If this is something that council wants to explore, we could probably explore it then. And this, this for another contextual point as well. On the, um, the, the water and source side, public utilities, they got a, their own separate bond covenants. We do do to some extent extended um, terms, sometimes 25, 30 years yes, sir. on that side. You know, so that it's more accepted on horizontal infrastructure, you know, but it's less so on this side. And I think what um, Dave is trying to say, it's not it's not an absolute no, but the timing, as the mayor likes to say, the timing of the jump has to be right. It has to be the right kind of project and the right kind of factors before um, we take that on. You know, so I would say if this is something that we want to explore, let's kind of consider that as we take the global picture of the entire CIP and then also as we start to make the policy decisions on how do we address the unmet needs for the flood protection program. Okay, first. Thank you, Patrick, because I was kind of going there. I didn't, didn't I thank the council member for showing for bringing this, but I don't think this has been a consensus amongst the body. It's maybe a couple people, and we haven't addressed the stormwater. And again, based on your proposed budgets, there's still a lot of big projects coming. We have some that are going to more coming out of closed and some serious ask. And I'm thankful, Dave, that you did acknowledge, and Mr. Manager, that typically it's on the stormwater side. Mm -hmm. And we need to make that a priority. And I'd love to hear from you the next time you come to hear about if we need to be looking at if we have a spending problem or a revenue problem, because our assessor is telling us that it's great, the, the hikes are going to have to come down, and that's tied to revenue. And I'm not seeing this huge increase of economic development projects that are adding to the tax base. So I'm very concerned that we may use this strategy for economic development projects versus what has been stated as a key priority amongst this council and our citizens, and that is the storm water uh, bond referendum that we uh, have acknowledged. And then listening to the school board, we just went through that exercise of designing these schools, and they're talking about 20, 30 years out, $700 million, big numbers. I just could not imagine risking our AAA over a project that may or may not turn out to, to, to benefit our taxpayers. So thank you. Hey, anybody else? Hey, Amelia. Well, I just wanted to thank you for your lived experience that you brought <coughs> to the table and being cautionary because we do want to keep this AAA. So thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks a bunch. Appreciate it. Exactly. Moving on. So, Mr. Mayor, members of council, at this time, Monica Krosky, Assistant City Manager, is going to give council an overview as it relates to where we are with the aquarium and then solicit information and guidance on you all as it relates to the relative next steps that you'd like for us to pursue. Thank you. I'm sorry. I mean, we are in the Sweet 16. I wasn't going to work UNC into this presentation. But thank you for that, Council Member Remick. I appreciate that. Go Tar Heels. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of City Council, I'm actually excited to present this uh, as a continuation of a public conversation that started well over a year ago. Um, really want to ground us. I usually start with the ask, but with this particular presentation, I really want to ground us in what all of this has been about from the day from day one. Um, it's really about council has been on a very deliberate path of how to best set up the aquarium to realize its mission, while also being realistic about the environment in which you govern. And the realities are there are lots of financial obligations, lots of capital infrastructure needs, and you all have been very vocal about your sensitivity to taxpayer affordability. Um, so you all have been requesting and you have been leveraging quantitative and qualitative data to inform the various discussions that you've been having. Um, I've had the privilege to share a good bit of this um, quantitative and qualitative data publicly previously. 
Um, I'm going to recap some of that in this presentation and introduce some more information that we've gathered since my last time presenting publicly. So this really is a timeline of some of our qualitative and quantitative data gathering. And I do think it's important that I spend some time highlighting this. Uh, so back in January of 2023, the director of the aquarium unveiled a renovation and expansion project. Uh, the aquarium's approaching 40 years old, um, and there's lots of opportunities to address its need. Um, this was a, 300, a 200 to $300 million expansion. Uh, unveiled that in a public meeting January 10th. Um, also, April 18th, as part of her budget presentation, um, talked about it there. And at that meeting, council really wanted to start the data gathering information so that you could have uh, well-informed, thorough discussions about your options. So in that meeting in April, you asked to have some information about other partnership ownership models. And then in the spring, again, continuing on your path of really wanting to evaluate all of the data, you asked about reduced scope options. Um, so in August, I had the privilege of presenting publicly uh, some of that information, that data gathering that we did as staff. So in that August 15th public presentation, um, went over ownership models that are used across the country. Going to recap that again in today's presentation. Um, based on that, council gave us three directives. Also in that, sorry, that presentation, we did unveil a reduced scope that we kind of came up with as staff. Um, that would have closed the aquarium for a time period, which council had no appetite in doing that. Um, really want to keep the aquarium open, available to visitors and residents alike. Um, so from that public briefing, council gave us three directives to talk to our partners, the foundation, uh, to gauge uh, the community sentiment about uh, the various options, and to test the market. Uh, this was all part of your data gather gathering process. Uh, so uh, the very next month, we met with the foundation. Uh, we also worked with a third party to administer a statistically uh, significant random sample survey. I'll talk a bit uh, later about that a bit more. And to test the market, we issued a non-binding RFI that I'll talk about extensively over several slides to come. Um, in November, we went into closed session because that's a procurement process. So we went into closed session uh, to talk about some of the responses that we got from the RFI. Um, just a couple of days later, we went and we met with the foundation and we shared that exact same information that we shared with you all. Um, so in December, because by this time we were getting, we had already had the public briefing, the media did quite a bit of coverage on it. Um, really want to check in with our employees. So we had an employee town hall so that we could hear their concerns, their questions. I'll be talking about that in a couple of the slides as well. Um, also that month, we released uh, media information. We released the survey results. Um, and then in February, what we did was we had uh, those who responded to the RFI come and visit us. I'll talk a bit more about that in the slides as well. Um, and so they visited us last month. Uh, last week, we had a closed session with you all to give you the feedback on what those folks thought about our community. Um, and now I have the pleasure of being here today. Uh, so those are just some highlights of the data gathering process that's been taking place for over a year. Um, in addition to some of these highlights, our city manager has been in uh, communication with the foundation chair. Uh, those meetings aren't necessarily on this timeline. So I want to recap the existing partnership model that we have. Uh, the foundation, they, and I really want to lay the groundwork that uh, the city and the foundation, we each have our separate agency, uh, but we're very much interdependent. Uh, one pretty much needs the other to be successful. Um, and I think this slide really lays that out. The aquarium, they own the, popu the animal population and exhibits. Um, they raise money for fundraising that do quite a bit of uh, community services that are just really valued by the community. I'll talk about that a little later on the survey slide. Uh, the Stranded Animal Rescue Operation, conservation, research, and uh, a lot of work that they do with the schools as well. Um, the city, we pay for, we own the buildings that the exhibits are in, uh, that the animals are in. We own the land. 
Uh, the employees work for the city. We pay their benefits. We pay their salaries. Uh, so it's very much a mutually beneficial partnership. So just recapping the situation that's been pretty well documented, uh, whether it's been interviews with the media by the aquarium director at the aquarium itself, whether it's been her presentations or myself standing here, pretty well documented that a lot of the key assets at the aquarium are at the end of their useful life. Um, we'll, we'll get some more of um, just how much of this has been shared with the public, uh, but really trying to figure out how best to address that, uh, given the financial realities of the city. And these are just four paths that really tend to rise as being options. And I want to go through them in quite a bit of detail. A status quo, um, our professional opinion that the status quo is not sustainable. And I'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, reduced scope, this is not the staff's reduced scope. Uh, the foundation hired consultants. Um, and they have a reduced scope um, that they would like for consideration. Obviously, the original um, proposal that came before you, and then this whole notion of an alternative partnership model. So let's talk about the status quo. Um, Well-documented capital needs, the financial uh, component of the aquarium. Uh, so this really here, what you're looking at, our budget numbers for the aquarium for this current fiscal year, with the exception of utilities. Utilities are not paid in the aquarium's budget. Utilities are paid from the Public Works Department. Public Works pulled uh, the utility bills associated with all of the aquarium's uh, three buildings, and that's an actual dollar amount from last year. So about two million in utilities alone. Um, we budget about two million in CIP, appropriations for the aquarium each year. So when you look at the current fiscal year budget, uh, their operating expenses are about 21 million. When you look at the revenue, the direct revenue, um, acknowledging that the aquarium has a significant economic impact, but when you look at the direct revenues that we receive, um, it's about 13 or 14 million dollars. So when you do that math, it's about a $7.4 million subsidy. And just because we've heard a lot of numbers today, and sometimes it's easy to start being dismissive of numbers, so just to give you some context, 7.4 million is about a penny on the tax rate, or about 110 firefighters, or 110 police officers. Um, so this is the current financial situation, but even as it is today, the capital needs for the aquarium are not being met. So that's why we would say it's unsustainable. Um, the last bullet point is something that we really want to emphasize, and I think just really, not that you all want sympathy, but just really people to understand the situations that you're in. If you want to fund a dollar more than we currently fund, there's corresponding financial decisions that you all will have to make, whether that's cutting out another project, reducing another project, deciding not to do another priority, or increasing revenues, or a combination thereof. You all do not have the luxury um, of just making the decision and not having a corresponding one. Unfortunately, you can't run a deficit, you don't print money, and you have to have a structurally sound budget. So that's really what brought into looking at what are those other options. Uh, so this is what the reduced scope, 50 million to $75 million that the foundation um, got their consultants to work for. What it does is creates new spaces for the animals because the exhibits are the animals' homes. So the exhibits are within our building, but the animals live in the exhibit. So it would provide new spaces for the animals. Um, what's not quite clear is what happens to the existing old infrastructure, which really are liability assets for the city. Uh, what happens to those under this reduced model? Um, it's likely that the foundation would be able to reduce the amount that we would need to borrow through their fundraising efforts. But just to give you scale, 50 million to 75 million in debt is about 5 million to 7.5 million in annual debt service. That would be on top of the current subsidy. So everything I just said multiplied by, by two. So going back to the original proposal, the original po proposal gives us a new parking deck it almost doubles the uh, footprint of the aquarium. 
It addresses the aging infrastructure. Um, there was projected increased visits, uh, projected um, economic impacts for that one. Uh, but again, all of the other things regarding the corresponding financial uh, decisions that would be on your shoulders remain true of how would you uh, fund the 20 million to 30 million more in debt service. Um, acknowledging that um, the foundation's fundraise, fundraising efforts could potentially reduce the amount of that annual debt service. So that's looking at the financial situation singularly as the, as the aquarium. Um, but as you've heard earlier from the schools and what you will start hearing as soon as my presentation is over, I think, Colin, I think your first step, you'll start hearing about these other needs. So the, just bringing it into the total broader city scan, uh, this time last week, you heard from our budget director about un, unfunded, delayed, deferred projects. And that was about the tune of $634 million. And that's before we load in the fact that our initial half a million dollar flood protection program is now a billion. When you add in the storm order, it's $991 million of unfunded, deferred, delayed capital projects. It's also important to remember uh, that the city's debt metrics and capacity is shared with the Virginia Beach City Public Schools. So, that, so they're not looked at separately, they're, they're the same. Uh, so I just wanna impress upon that for the public just so we can have an appreciation uh, just for the gravity of the decisions that you all have to make uh, around this table. So those were the first three options. Status quo, really don't think it's sustainable for the animals. Um, reduced scope, original scope. And now I really wanna spend some time talking about this alternative partnership model. One slide at a time, Monica. Uh, initially, you all wanted some research about when we look at the lay of the land, we know other people have zoos, other people have aquariums, what models are they using? Uh, so we did research, um, but we only wanted to look at other aquariums and zoos that are accredited by the American, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Uh, we are interested in people who meet the same high standards for their animal wel welfare as, as us. And when we did that research, we looked at 32 of the 57 US aquariums that are accredited and 13 zoos because aquariums and zoos have similar models. And what we found is that most of them do not have the same partnership ownership model that we have. We're in the blue, everyone else is in the orange. If I had been smart, I would have did this in Carolina blue, but um, we're in the blue and others are in orange. Uh, something else we found when we did the research is that there have been transitions in the model that uh, folks use. So just to highlight a few um, in Sacramento, it says in 1997, as city funding continued to decrease, the Sacramento Zoological Society took over financial and daily management. Um, when you look at the Birmingham Zoo, with so many financial demands on the city taking precedence, uh, the mayor led the way for the privatization of the zoo. Uh, similar with Atlanta Zoo, highly publicized events revealed deteriorating conditions at the zoo. New governance followed in 1985 with the zoo's privatization. So what we found is that it was not trailblazing or unheard of for people to be um, in situations in which they reaffirm or they reimagine how they are um, owning or the partnership models that they use. So that's what we found as we scanned the country for other AZA aquariums and zoos. So bringing it back a little closer to home, uh, you all asked for uh, this qualitative quantitative data and it's gotten quite a bit of attention. Uh, if it's not me presenting publicly, uh, the media has done quite a bit of reporting on this exploration, uh, this data gathering and um, from our standpoint, and this is just one example from the December wavy, um, it was an interview as well as an article, we found that they've done a pretty balanced media coverage, really helping us to amplify the steps that were taken. Um, so really highlighting the current situation, highlighting what we're doing um, as an organization in our research. Also 
talking about what the foundation was doing, what the foundation was thinking. Um, so definitely getting the word out to the community, helping to amplify these public briefings that have been taking place of making sure um, that folks are aware. So because folks are so aware, really tapping in with our partners and making sure that we are um, hearing their concerns and getting their qualitative data has been important. Like I said, in December, we had employee town halls. Um, I'm not gonna go line by line of the data gathering, but really just wanted to represent the collaborative nature of the data sharing um, that's been taking place. But in the employee town halls, really three themes arise, like three very reasonable questions um, came up in their town halls. One, how would their employment be impacted if the city transitioned to a new model? And what we've been saying to them, what we said to council, is that it's our firm belief that um, employees would have options. Um, transitions have happened before in other places and employees have remained intact. Um, can't answer that to 100% degree certainty, but we know that we have over 600 vacancies in our city um, and a good portion of aquarium employees have transfer transferable skill sets. There's probably about 20 or fewer that are very specific to aquatic life. Um, another concern is the stranding response. Um, employees, as well as the community, once I get to the survey, really hold that program as a, as a source of pride, something that means quite a bit to them. Uh, so wanting to understand uh, what happens uh, to that program if we transition. Uh, we'll see in a couple slides later, but there have been transitions with aquariums that had stranding rescue programs uh, where the foundation of the nonprofit ran them and they stayed intact even through a transition to a private operator. And then lastly, another theme that comes up quite a bit when we talk to employees is just wanting to know what, when can they expect a decision and how will that decision be communicated. Um, the foundation, um, I know they sent a letter directly to city council about to reduce scope, um, whether it's interviews or letters, uh, they've been very clear that animal welfare and the exhibits conditions is something that's very much um, top of concern for them. So for both of these stakeholder groups, uh, desire for clarity and timing matters. Um, so very much reasonable takeaways from these stakeholder groups. The next group that council definitely wanted um, to get input from was the community. And um, really wanna spend some time talking about community input. Um, I'm very big on data limitations and that's what this whole slide is about. Um, essentially, any and every method of research has limitations. And there are trade-offs that you select once you choose your research method. And community input is a type of research method. Whether it's a community meeting, whether it's a survey, it's a way that you um, conduct research. So unlike focus group interviews, or you can put public meetings in this one, one of the trade-offs with survey research is that it doesn't have the details or the depth that you could get if you were doing an interview. However, unlike public meetings or focus groups or interviews, uh, representative samples, and I wanna pause on representative too because that can be a trade-off with public meetings or focus groups. We know there are certain barriers to participation, whether it's transportation, whether it's people who have multiple jobs or work an odd shift or have responsibilities that they can't come to City Hall, can't get to a community meeting. Um, sometimes the feedback you hear is not representative of the community at large. So when you do a representative sample survey, one of the benefits is that you can make observations for large populations. And you can even go a step further and you can segment the data to see if perceptions change by certain attributes. So if peop do people of a certain socioeconomic status have a certain sentiment versus those who may have a lower income? Or do folks based on residency, folks who've lived here a long time have a different sentiment um, than those who have not? So those are some of the trade-offs you get between a survey versus a public meeting. Um, but the important thing is researchers or methodologists really encourage you to do multiple methods. Um, the method that we 
selected for this one was a third party administered survey. Um, so that folks would be random sampled, have the convenience of having a survey mailed to their home. They can complete it by either going online or returning it into a postage page, posted paid envelope. Um, and what we found is that it gave us a demographically representative sample. Um, so what you did, that means you heard from people that demographically represent your community at large. We also got a very low margin of error at a 95% confidence level. So that means that this is really good data, really reliable, accurate data. Um, so some of the questions we asked on this survey, we wanted to gauge the community sentiment about potential paths for addressing the aquarium's current condition. And these are the results. We asked folks to rate it. Um, and what we found is that the majority of respondents were neutral to very supportive for all three options, whether it was the full expansion, whether it was a third party operator um, operating the aquarium or a third party owner. Admittedly, what we did not ask on the survey, um, hindsight 2020, is how supportive would they be of increasing taxes to support the full expansion or how supportive would they be of foregoing other priorities to support the full expansion? But one of the questions we did ask them was to rank uh, public infrastructure priorities. Roads, stormwater flooding, and school buildings all ranked higher than aquarium infrastructure projects. Another question that we asked the uh, aquarium really wanted to make sure we got data on was asking people to rate the importance of some of the programming. And what we found was just overwhelming support. Uh, stranding, rescue mission, 91% of respondents agreed that, that that was important or very important. The educational programs that they put on, 90% agreed that those programs were important. So that's some of the community input that you've gotten from the statistically valid, demographically representative sampled survey. So another part of testing this alternative partnership model was looking at the market. So we released a non-binding public RFI in September. Uh, three firms expressed interest, two submitted formal responses. Um, so this ZOA group, I can't pronounce their name, I mess it up every time I practice, um, but it's ZOA is what they go by. Um, they expressed interest, they saw some of the media coverage, um, so they came to the party a little late. Uh, so we are currently learning a bit more about this company. Um, we had a quick conversation with them uh, the other week. Uh, we understand that they have experience operating local government-owned aquariums. Uh, the St. Louis Aquarium is a government locally owned aquarium. Um, and they also operate the Children's Aquarium Dallas. Um, so depending on how council chooses to proceed, uh, we can continue to do data gathering um, on this company as well. But the two responders to the RFI are probably household name companies. Ripley Entertainment and Hershen Enterprises are the two entities that formerly responded to our RFI. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about these two firms. Um, Ripley is part of the Jim Patson Group. It's just a huge company. It's the second uh, largest privately owned company in Canada. They have over 49,000 employees, over 100 tractions, and 12 uh, brands in 10 countries. So Ripley's, believe it or not, um, Guinness uh, Book of Records, you've, you've probably heard of some of those. Uh, but one of their businesses that they hold, line of businesses they hold true to their heart, are the aquarium business. They have three aquariums. One is another beach community, we won't say by name. Uh, they have one in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and one in uh, Toronto. Um, just something about their Gatlinburg Aquarium is that since 2017, it's ranked as either the best or second best aquarium in North America. Um, so they have been in the aquarium business since 1997. They have three aquariums. Each of their aquariums is accredited by AZA, just like our Virginia Aquarium. Uh, their aquariums are large. Our aquarium is about 650 um, 
650,000 gallons, 650 million gallons, thousand gallons, sorry, 650,000 gallons. Theirs are pretty much like twice the size. It's a lot of water, that, which explains the utility bill. Yeah, yeah. Um, they don't have any experience with acquisitions, but they do have experience with government. So one of their aquariums sits on locally owned land, and they have a long-term lease. Um, they don't have experience working with nonprofit or foundation, uh, but they did express openness to it. Uh, they do have a marine science center. Uh, they don't have experience with stranding and rescue um, operations. Uh, I think this annoys the manager, but I do want to read the mission statements because I think it tells us a bit more about firms. It says, our mission is to provide a top quality, world-class aquatic life facility that will foster environmental education, conservation, and research while simultaneously providing entertainment for visitors of all ages. As a green power participant, we are proud supporters of locally generated renewable resources. So that's Ripley's. Hershey Enterprises is the second firm. This is a privately uh, family owned firm that was founded in the 50s by Jack and Pete. Um, they're the largest family-owned theme attraction organization in the U.S. They have about 11,000 employees. Um, some of their businesses, Dollywood, um, Harlem Globetrotters, those are part of their businesses. Uh, but similar to Ripley, aquarium business is um, a line of business that they're really fond of. Uh, they have aquariums in the Cincinnati region, Philadelphia, and Vancouver. A massive one in Vancouver, actually. Um, their Newport Aquarium and their Cam Camden Aquarium continuously listed as top 10 best aquariums by popular vote. Um, they've been in the aquarium business since 2008. Like Ripley, they have three aquariums. All three are accredited by AZA, just like our aquarium. Um, massive aquariums, 2.5 million gallons of water. Uh, they have experience with acquisitions. All of their aquariums um, they have acquired. They have experience with government. They have experience with foundations. Uh, so the aquariums that they've, and not just aquariums, um, they have another line of business that when they acquired it, uh, had a nonprofit foundation. Uh, those have remained intact. Uh, they have a marine science center. That's a partnership with a nonprofit. And they have a stranding and rescue operation that's considered one of the largest in the world. And that's in partnership with a nonprofit that pre-existed uh, prior to the acquisition. Their mission statement is, Hershen is committed to its vision of bringing families closer together and its mission of creating memories worth repeating by producing wholesome, immersive family entertainment experiences. It is our preference to maintain and preserve the core values and operations of all our companies while infusing our culture of leading with love. So they came down last month because it's been a data gathering process, not just for us, also for them. So if they're considering being in partnership with us, they wanted to know more about us. They wanted to see our assets. Uh, so they got to meet with uh, key city leaders. They got to meet with a foundation. Uh, so that could inform their data gathering as well. So I have just a few more slides, but really what we're leading I'm leading us to is really where we started. All of this has been about how can we find a sustainable future for the aquarium while being realistic about the financial pressures and obligations and taxpayer affordability. So I want to walk you through in a bit more detail, not necessarily calling them pros and cons, didn't want to put a judgment on them. Uh, but want to just be transparent about considerations that are associated with all of the paths. So the status quo, really do not think it's sustainable. Um, that does involve a $7.4 million subsidy, uh, would not address the key assets that are end of useful life. So what that means is the inevitable near-term need for emergency repairs or decommissioning of exhibits. Um, one of the things is that it does not require a new partnership. Uh, we wouldn't need to bring a new partner to the table. Um, the other path, the original scope, uh, would require those corresponding financial uh, decisions by council of either reducing 
the something in the CIP, not doing something, another priority, or increasing revenue. Uh, we would incur about 20 to $30 million more in annual debt service, however, acknowledging that the foundation's fundraising could decrease that amount. There are projected increase in economic impact and increased visits. Um, it addresses the aging infrastructure while also providing new spaces and new exhibits. Um, it doesn't require establishing a new partnership. Uh, the reduced scope still would require um, those corresponding financial decisions that council would have to make. Um, the $5 million to $7.5 million more in annual debt service um, on top of a subsidy, it doesn't completely address what happens to the existing aging infrastructure that council owns. Um, but it doesn't require establishing a new partnership. As far as continuing to pursue an alternative partnership model, RFP um, has very structured deadlines, less flexible. I think government RFPs, the reputation precedes it, um, could likely take longer. And that may have unfavorable impacts on operations, staffing, or market interest from these potential partners. Um, one of the benefits of the RFP is that we would get commitments on paper to be acknowledged. Um, it reduces taxpayer obligation for funding an asset where a proven private market exists. Uh, it does require establishing a new partnership. We would have to bring a new partner to the table who would help us invest in the aquarium's future. Uh, to make sure that our interests are properly represented, we do recommend getting an owner's representative. Like I said uh, early in the presentation, it's not trailblazing. Transitions have happened before, so there are people who have experience doing this. Um, alternative partnership, competitive direct negotiations. Uh, this is an opportunity for agile deadlines. It could go faster, it could go slower. Um, but it would be nimble, which would allow us for uh, engaging and understanding st stakeholders' needs as, as they arise. Um, so we could be responsive to priorities and interests. Uh, again, reduces taxpayer obligation for funding an asset where a proven private market exists. It does require bringing a new partner to the table. Um, and again, we would recommend an owner's representative. So with that, these really are some of the options for council's consideration. Um, continue, one of the options is to continue pursuing an alternative partnership model. And these are some of the factors for, for that. Um, just taking into account the current subsidy, subsidy uh, avoiding additional annual debt service. Um, based on the research, most accredited aquariums and zoos are not owned and operated by government. Um, when we got the community input from the statistically valid, demographically representative survey, roads, flooding, stormwater, and school buildings ranked as higher priorities. So this preserves the debt capacity for those higher priorities. It reduces taxpayer obligation where a proven private market exists. Successful transitions have occurred with private entities preserving stranding programs, research, and educational efforts and top accredited aquarium companies have expressed an interest in partnering with the foundation and the city to help us pursue a sustainable future for the foundation. Um, staff, with all policy decisions, we will go where council as a body leads us. Um, so unless the manager has anything else to add, Mr. Mayor, I warmly invite council's questions, discussion, and direction. Patrick, anything? No, Mr. Mayor, the floor is all councils. Okay. Rosemary, you had a suggestion. I think when we talked about this before, I, I made the statement, we're not doing this because we don't care about the aquarium. Uh, we're doing this because we do care, and we want to preserve it, not only for our locals, but our visitors alike. And I, I think we're all in a really, really difficult position. Um, I think... Obviously, I think the Hershen model from our interviews and what we've learned about them seems to be a better fit for, for who we are and who our aquarium is and, and meets what the people in Virginia Beach would uh, expect. But I think before we do anything else, um, we need a site visit. We need to send a delegation of people from the foundation 
and from this council and appropriate staff to visit one of Hershen's aquariums just to see for ourselves. Not just take the word of a website or what people tell us, but an on-site visit to see if it would really be a good fit for us. Would the, is the stranding what they say it is? Is the educational pieces what they say that are what they are? I, I think we really, before we do anything really big, um, I think we should have a delegation go and visit. And I think it needs to be one that's on the coast because they're the ones who would be dealing with the stranding and be more like us. So my, I would recommend, um, I, I think you're right, the status quo is just not going to work. I mean, we could have just terrible nightmares of some of those exhibits failing and having um, our exhibits and live animals lost in the process. So I, I would really love to see a delegation, and, and I know time is of the essence. And I, I don't have a list of who it is that should go. Um, that would be determined by all of you, but, but I think we need to go and visit these aquariums and see for ourselves. Okay, Barbara and Chris. I don't think this body can make a next step decision unless we are also at the table with the foundation because we only own the building and the property. They do everything else. And so we really, I think, have to have them as a part of this discussion right now before we go anyplace else because very clearly, and from this letter we have today, they aren't, they are really thinking in another direction. And I don't think we can move another step without sitting down with them and having them very much a part of this because after all, they own the animals, they own the exhibits, they do the stranding, they do the education. And if they aren't willing to go forward with a third party, there's no deal. So I think we have to hear from them and they have to be a part of this decision. Okay, uh, Chris and then Amelia. Thank you, Mayor Dyer. Um, and I appreciate Vice Mayor Wilson's recommendation. I just don't understand why Hershen um, versus looking and site visiting uh, Ripley when these are the two. And uh, being that Ripley has been ranked, uh, I know they're not coastal in Gatlinsburg, but I have visited that aquarium with my family. Um, I would think we would want to see what the best in class is doing, um, not just the one on a coast. Um, so I, I couldn't just support visiting just Hirsch. You know, it was a, Hershen. And then one thing I wrote down is, um, you know, we often talk about ROI and this is my concern with some of the conversations that have been taking place around some of the other uh, peripheral priorities is we don't have an understanding yet from the manager of all the commitments, what's required. And just today we're at like $900 million we're looking at extending bonds for 30 years, um, a lot going on. Um, I would be supportive of making this a referendum, take it to the people. This is their aquarium. It's been their aquarium and I've been here 40 years. It's always been a Virginia asset, a Virginia beach asset. Um, I haven't seen much movement from the General Assembly in terms of coming through with major funding for the aquarium, Mr. Manager, unless Brent's here, if he can update us, but I haven't seen anything major coming from there. And so just as vital uh, to Virginia Beach's arts and culture, so is our aquarium. And so I would love to see um, uh, the question posed, and I'm going to go to District 8 and ask them if they would be supportive of a referendum because we're looking at cutting two cents. But really, the loss or the investment that we're making to attract so many people to Virginia Beach, especially on rainy days when there's nothing to do and they don't want to go to the beach, they go to the aquarium. We're looking at a penny, uh, a penny in, in rate. Um, and we're trying to, you've been directed to find dedications for other priorities. I wasn't here last week, but it passed 10 to zero. Um, and I, I could not imagine going to the public and them not supporting, um, at least in a referendum, uh, letting us know, because I don't feel comfortable making a decision without going to the public when this is their aquarium. And I, I've heard the argument that it's the Virginia, um, but we've supported the Virginia uh, Musical Theater. We've supported other just Virginias that aren't Virginia Beach. 
And I would hate to see us lose animals. I'd hate to see us lose aquarium. And this foundation has just worked so hard to expand the aquarium, uh, which some of us attended that ribbon cutting. And so um, I don't know what the process is to get it on the ballot. Um, I know there's two types of referendums and it was tossed out for the 10 one and we were already, we understood where the public wanted to go and there were still members around this table that were pushing for referendums. So I say, take it to the people, let them decide and um, we go from there. Thank you. Hey, anybody else? Of worth and then uh, and then Amelia. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Ms. <clears throat> Monica, for the presentation. And so I just want the public to know that right now this body, as you can see, has not made any decisions, contrary to what some rumors are that we've made decisions. You've outlined five potential courses, and that's what we're you know presenting to the public today, five potential courses to take. Uh, I agree, I think both uh, of the potential private sector uh, bidders uh, should be considered, not just one. Uh, each has their pros uh, to their uh, respective um, businesses. Um, but in terms of a, of a referendum to the public, I would think we would want, right now, we don't know any model at all for this privatization. So I think we need to know more what it looks like before we go to the public at all on anything, because the public's going to say, yes, no, maybe, but what's the deal? Well, we don't know what the deal is. So I think more talks and negotiations need to happen, whether it's, I guess, publicly, but this is also a very private business to, to determine, so I, that's where I am. Okay, uh, Josh, forgive me, but Amelia had her hand no up problem. first. Amelia? Yeah. Yeah. You first. I'm, ladies I'm first, uh, ladies first. Again, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm leaning somewhat to where Barbara is mentioning that the foundation. This is a group that are very passionate <coughs> of going over their history, how many millions they raised. Moving. I met one of the ladies who did, you know, cookies and little fundraisers at the very beginning. So you have people here who really are better than this. So it's important, even though we look at that it's unsustainable, we still have quite a few people from the foundations. If there are any here, can you stand up a minute? If you're here, please stand, just showing. They do have support. They're very passionate about what we do with this. So um, in my mind, we really need to walk along with them. I know right now, as you mentioned, the status quo is unsustainable. You've also mentioned what the community said, roads, stormwater, and so forth. So there need to be much more a discussion where we bring the two of them, besides service, to the table so they can give their pitch and vice versa before we actually decide on one. Both groups that we had, you know, were very impressive, but they're from somewhere else. We're here, this is our city, and we need to give a more balance to it, to it all, or doing a referendum or so forth. Hey, Josh. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Monica, for your, I guess, almost a year and a half. That's, it's been a while. Yeah, the manager loves giving me, giving me special projects. Yeah. And, and, um, and, and, and I want to echo um, two things I heard, one from uh, our vice mayor and then one from Councilman Remick, that, um, we're having this discussion because of how much we value and love the aquarium. I mean, I, I, it is it is a favorite place for me to take my kids. Um, it is uh, now with the South Building open, something to do on both sunny and rainy days. So, um, I, and none of us, none of us. I, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I mean, I know I've heard everybody around this table say we don't want to do anything that. Um, jeopardizes the aquarium's future that um, offends or um, devalues the the contributions and uh, that the foundation has made over over decades and um, we, we're we're trying our very very best to come at something together and I, I like the idea of. Um, sending some folks, particularly some people 
from the foundation board um, and and one or two council members, but um, and whoever else ought to go to go take a look at these facilities um, so that we can have a little bit more education. Um, I, I I think I, I got an email today from somebody who very passionately articulated their desire for us to keep the, um, the aquarium in, in city ownership and, and, and foundation control and suggested things like partnering with schools. Well, I know the aquarium has for a long time partnered with schools. Mm -hmm. So I think there's, there, you know, I think there's a little bit of misperception even in the public domain about um, not only, not only how, how the aquarium is operated, but, you know, I mean, I'm really glad that these challenges are out there you know, under, under the lights in front of the cameras because um, status quo is not sustainable. Um, I, I don't know that the uh, reduced scope really fixes the problem. I think it's a band-aid um, to, to move you know, the animals to, to new facilities. And, and, I, and I think that um, if we're going to go somewhere else than where we are now, um, we've got to be there with a partner who is familiar with um, nonprofit organizations. We've got to be there with a partner who is familiar or at least um, comfortable with the acquisitions and and, um, and stranding operations. So, and and so, and and I think the people who are doing that work for us in the aquarium will be able to tell us even better than we'll we, we'll know by by actually going and talking with them and 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 um, and, and seeing what their operations are all about. So. Um, so no, a decision hasn't been made, but I think we're presented with, you know, some some pretty significant um, hurdles to overcome. Um, I don't know if a referendum um, solves the timing issue, um, because I think you know we you know, and I, and I also don't think it's fair to the people who who work at the aquarium to be you know at, at the you know at the whim of a of an election decision. You know, um, yes or no <laughs> on, a, on election day. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not really convinced that that's the right answer. And plus, I mean, unfortunately and fortunately, thank goodness, we're, we're here. We are. And we're the most educated consumers of the information. So, um, and and the, the the folks that work at the aquarium, the folks that that populate our foundation, are the the, the most educated about what they do. So, so let's put everybody together and let's figure this out. Barbara? Well, putting everybody together, if you mean bringing the foundation to the table as an equal partner with us, because I think they all, <coughs> this aquarium would never have gotten to where it is without this foundation. And we don't do it. They do. Can I just read this from their letter here? The foundation believes council should not take any direction towards possible privatization until you have heard from our board, the thousands of current aquarium members and donors and the public. Remember, they have been able to do what they've done because there were donors who were willing to give their money. Are they going to be willing to do that uh, with this other situation? I think we don't know. To go on, it says, to take any further action before asking the opinion of your 40-year partner and the public who clearly values this public facility is short-sighted. And I think those two sentences say it all. We don't have the right to make the decision about this facility by ourselves without the equal participation of our partner who has made it all possible. And I really think we can't decide today without really having a genuine, real, discussion with them about how they see what they can do going forward. They may not be able to see any pathway for them if we do take this other step. So I think until we have them at the table and giving them, giving us their advice, I, I don't see how we can decide what the next step is. Because without them, the aquarium would never have gotten to where it is. And remember, it's the place that everybody who comes to Virginia Beach goes to visit, and we are, what, the third highest visitation in the whole state next to uh, um, amusement parks? 
I, I think that speaks volumes, and, and we have to hear from them. And I, I just can't even think that we could go forward without genuinely asking these folks to join us with a discussion and a decision. Yeah, and I concur, Red, and let me get to Chris a minute, but I, I don't think we were ever intended to make a decision today. Chris? Thanks, Mayor Dyer, and I'm appreciative of uh, the comments and maybe the referendum's not, but it's the people's choice. And I think if we're not going to go to the, the, the general public, we should at least do what we did for Rudy Loop, which is have significant public engagement because, again, I was shocked when I saw in the budget uh, recommended $60 million Rudy Loop, will not produce any revenue uh, unless you're going to add retail to it. It's in the middle of that reduced scope between 50 and 60. So again, we, we have the, the capacity, clearly. It's in the manager's proposed budget. And I don't support any taxpayer money sending any council members on a tour of an aquarium. Send the board, send their top donors, and send the staff, uh, and then let them come back and let us know what they want to do. Um, because I, I just don't know why we would need to go uh, and look at an aquarium, just bring the information back, give us a nice firm update. And then if we can direct a manager to do the same type of engagement we did with Rudy Loop, uh, that will give us plenty of information and insight, and then we can make a decision. Thank you. Okay, Sabrina. I, I certainly do uh, concur with the statement that has been made from the letter from the Virginia Aquarium Foundation. Um, that's a very sobering point. Uh, I think the next steps that were asked is to include them, bring them to the table, and then make a decision based on conferring with them uh, the next steps forward. But um, this, this letter certainly says it all. Uh, I certainly don't want to be moving forward without them at the table and a part of this discussion. Okay. So at this point, you know, once again, you know, I'll use a term I used before, confront confrontation with reality. And one of the things is we're going to have to battle our competing resources that we're going to have out there. Uh, you know, that being said, I, you know, I don't believe it was our intention at all to give a direction to move forward one way or the other. But I think it was fortuitous that some of the board members had the opportunity, you know, to hear about what school said, to hear about our bond stuff, to hear you know, the challenge that we have and perhaps our motivation for, you know, seeking some type of uh, get to yes, you know, for everybody concerned. And, you know, obviously the status quo is just not acceptable at all. And once again, whether the reduced uh, scope is going to fix the problem is unlikely, which really puts it to in the high strata of, you know, a lot of money that, you know, is necessary. But once again, I think it was always the intent uh, to bring the foundation to the table, bring the input from the donors. And, you know, we're successful when we bring the public in, uh, you know, to the table on these major, major projects. And uh, but once again, I think w it was good because, you know, the members uh, of the, the foundation heard it. The public saw it. And it's just, a bit, you know, the first step of the long journey of getting to yes. And uh, so, but once again, I think this, I think we as a city had an obligation to at least bring it forward for consideration uh, because ultimately the goal of the aquarium is going to be not only survival, but success. And, uh, but once again, I think that's going to be done with collaboration. Thank you, Ma uh, Monica. Yeah. Rosemary. Yeah, thank you. That's very generous. <clears throat> We don't know what we're saying yes or no to mm -hmm. unless we actually go and see what they do. And that's why it's so important that the foundation be involved so that you are doing it. They are included. We are joint decision makers. Um, but it's really important. We may have a delegation go and see the aquarium and say, it's not what we wanted, it's not what we had in mind. Or it could be we could have a seamless transition so that our local people and visitors would never see the difference in the quality that is given to the aquarium and whatever new ideas and maybe better profitability, but make sure that the things that we value so much is included with the education, with the stranding, with the veterinarian care. 
But we're sitting around a table without opening our eyes and looking at something else. So I still think a site visit, whether it's to both entities or one of them, you know, it really doesn't matter to me. And maybe, you know, Chris, you're right that both of them should be visited. Um, but I do think somebody from council should go because we are half of the decision makers with the foundation. But I really think before we make a decision for anything, to go and see because we don't know what we don't know. Okay. All right, Patrick. So, Mr. Mayor, it's not clear to me what we're supposed to do. Are we supposed to just continue, continue the status quo or are we supposed to explore the alternative partnership models? I would, uh, you know, I think the first thing to do is really have the sit down with with the foundation, you know, to you know get the, to get the pulse of what's going on, to get them at least buy into, you know, what the, why we're doing this, uh, and I think that's going to be missing a central I've had that conversation with the foundation probably three times as a group, and then probably two or three or four times in a conversation with the foundation chair of why. We're exploring this. I can have that again, but that will just keep us in this place where we won't. And I don't hear any appetite to do a reduced scope or or a significant plus up. So to me, what I'm hearing is just continue the status quo. Yeah. yeah Michael, you had your hand up and then uh, Barbara. No, no, sorry. The status quo is unsustainable as your own staff reports. Mm -hmm. So my view is absolutely not maintain the status quo. Mm -hmm. In addition, Monica, I don't know, I don't have my thing in front of me to look at the number, but could you go back to the timeline that you presented? Oh, sure. Top of my presentation, Council Member. I was going to point something out that the manager just shared. I think there have been no, no fewer than three meetings with the foundation and a variety of council members, including me, have met with representatives from the foundation separately in a part to both learn what their concerns are, understand their perspectives clearly, understand the role and the impact and the contributions the foundation has made and continues to make, um, and consider those carefully as part of these conversations. So I know of three that uh, Mr. Duhaney participated in or staff led, but there have been many um, many other meetings that have occurred from council members. I don't think it's fair to characterize that the foundation has not been included or part of this conversation. Um, and I do want to uh, make a note just about, um, well, I'll, I'll save that for a future conversation, but I think there are no commitments made. We want to understand what all, what every option could possibly be. And in order to do that, I think we should continue to understand what's possible in the alternative management uh, options. It doesn't mean we're making a commitment, but I think you, sh in my opinion, is that you should continue to have the conversations to get us the information so that we can make an informed uh, decision with the foundation, with the public, with the staff, with each other and the council. So, so that um, we have all the information available, but I, I do not um, do not agree that we should continue the status quo. I actually have some really substantial concerns about the aquarium. I visited there recently. I visited the new newly opened building. Um, I do think we someone doesn't have to be me uh, by any means, but I do think people from this body, from the foundation, from the community, from the staff should look at the other aquariums as a compare and contrast. And um, I, I think we need to have this information. Um, and, and we should all have this information so that we can make an informed decision that's best for the community. Okay, Barbara, and then Hush. Well, I just go back to what I've been saying about we really need to find out whether this, the foundation could continue in any, I'm reading this here, we, um, agreed to keep an open mind, understanding that our nonprofit foundation could no longer exist with a private operator per our articles of incorporation with the IRS. So we can't talk with these other companies 
because we might not be able to offer them anything except a building at a site. We may not be able to offer them animals and exhibits and stranding and education because that's the foundation. And if they go away, we don't have that as a part of the deal. So I think we really have to find out what the foundation can do and is willing to do before we can do another thing. I just look at these, these legalities. It's just not all us. Uh, it's not as if the aquarium is, is a, a, an entity of the city in and of itself. Without this other group, it's nothing, and we don't have a, we don't have a deal to make. And I think we have to be honest about that with whoever we're talking with. Okay, Hutch and then uh, Chris, well, and then Jennifer. Did you have something you want to say? I could wait till. Okay. Well, I guess I guess like any of us that have businesses and and do things. Can't we can't we proceed down both paths at the same time? Um, I obviously want to hear what the foundation has to say. Monica laid out your, this side very well. It seems like both could occur, um, and if we get to a decision point, I think that's what Miss Henley's saying. We have to decide then where we're which way we're going. But there's a lot of unanswered questions here. So why can't we just go down both paths? Is I guess my simple statement. Good idea, Chris. And, uh, Patrick, first. Okay. This is my last comment. I just, uh, we've been getting some emails, and uh, some may say this sounds uh, silly, um, but um, I don't know if all of the body have even visited the aquarium in the new exhibit. So we want to send someone on council to make a decision, but you know, I'm not going to say by a show of hands, but why don't we just take a field trip to what we currently have? And see, because I don't, I'm not sure if everybody on the city council has visited the aquarium, seen the new exhibits, been behind the scenes with Miss Cynthia, seen the rescue, met with staff. I mean, that would make a lot of sense to do that. That cost us nothing. And then out of that, uh, maybe send someone. But uh, I mean, first, first base is acknowledging what we have here already. Yeah, and you know, Chris, I agree. And the other thing is to see the new part, how magnificent it is, but also look at the aging infrastructure of the, you know, the current one too. I think it would be educational. Okay, and then uh, okay, Patrick, and then yeah. I can wait till, but I okay. So, Mr. Mayor, members of council, this is where my concerns are. Right, we've been going on down this. We've been going on this path for 15 months so far. Right, and there is everybody agrees, like how we like when we first presented to you all in August that the status quo is unsustainable, right? But I'm not hearing a desire from you all to do the original scope because that was a deal that was too rich of a pitch for you all to hit. And then we don't like the reduced scope because of the mothballing of our other assets that's just gonna delay and defer another deferred maintenance project that we're gonna have to take care of in the future. We all concur that the um, foundation is an important partner to us. But my fear is if we take no action and we don't explore these paths, 15 months from now, we're gonna be at the same very place. And we're gonna have real issues to deal with. You know, we all talk about the shark tank and the seals tank and the issues there as well, right? Concrete and salt water, their energy use for life don't mix forever, you know? I'll go, I, I suggest we go down the path that Council Member Hutchison kind of recommended. Yeah. We can continue to explore and have a conversation. This council's not making a decision today. To make a decision is a public vote. We're nowhere close to that, right? This is to engage these interested firms to see what kind of offer could be brought to the table that could make sense for the city council to consider and also for the foundation to consider. And I'll continue talking to the foundation, but I don't think it's in anybody's best interest to punt this any longer than we already are. We're already atrophying staff, right? And it's gonna be hard for us to recruit and retain aquarium professionals. We're in this state of purgatory and limbo, right? So that's my offer, you know, and that's where the path I'd like to proceed, but obviously I don't go anywhere that you all don't send me. Oh, but I, th I think that being said, before we get to uh, her and Sabrina, you know, I think, you know, the prudent path is, you know, through the dual tracks for right now, and you know, make the site visits. I think the site visits are gonna be essential about you know, a vision of what can be. So I think that's the way to go. Jennifer and Sabrina. I just wanted to try to see how we're moving forward, but you provided some clarity, so I'm fine with that direction. Thank you. Sabrina. 
I guess um, what I would say um, is that, you know, I'm, I'm not suggesting this be stagnant, um, but what I would say is looking at this letter, and I'll read what it says here uh, from the foundation, although we have yet to take a formal stance on this matter, it is important to clarify that we are not endorsing or asking for any direction from council to move forward uh, towards a private sale of the aquarium. And this includes moving forward with a formal RFP. And so usually when you have a discussion between both parties, there should be some type of consensus. I mean, I've been in part of discussions where, um, and I haven't, I wasn't in the discussion with the city manager, but I don't know what was said, but oftentimes, um, sometimes a position can be conveyed uh, to whoever the party is, but then their suggestions and their solutions and their input may not be incorporated or part of the discussion to move forward. And so, I mean, I don't know, um, but it sounds like with this correspondence, um, there is not a consensus here. And um, if you've had discussions, um, certainly that's fine, but maybe you should have a discussion where both parties uh, can convey what they can and want to do and how they want to support moving forward, because clearly this is saying it hasn't taken place. And that is my concern. Um, I, I want to make sure we are addressing their concerns because they took the time to write a letter. Uh, if it, this letter was dated previous to your conversations, then I would have said, okay, but it's not. It's dated for the 25th which leads me to believe there are some outstanding issues with the foundation that really do need to be addressed and their side needs to be heard uh, and incorporated into what they're doing because they're saying one thing, we're saying another, um, and we want to move forward, but it's hard to move forward when the parties don't agree because down the road when you have a RFP that you have uh, invested in and it's... Uh, not the right way to go, but you knew all the time. So I'm just saying, as you go down the road, make sure, you know, we're addressing their concerns because they haven't been addressed. This is evidenced by the letter. Okay, uh, Rosemary, Josh, and then my. So I just need a point of clarification. Um, are we talking about a sale or are we talking about a lease? I thought that we were talking more about a lease. And that might make a difference to people. I a lease? That we're just to clarify, council's saying nothing but to have a more deliberate, prolonged conversation with possibly three parties to see what a proposal can possibly look like. And then what I'm also hearing is explore that it could be a lease. I, I haven't heard any desire from you all to change ownership of the land. From what I've heard from our conversations is that you all desire to retain control of the land so that nobody can change the use beyond something that you all authorize, right? So to me, those are things that we would play out and have a conversation with interested parties to see if anybody can make sense, it make a deal that makes sense to you all to support. But also part of that as well is you all want us to continue talking to the foundation to get a sense where they're at. Again, my concern is with indecision, we're making a decision about the future fate of the aquarium by not making a choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's understood. But, okay, Michael. Josh and then Michael. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to go really quick. Um, number one, um, I agree with this letter um, in that um, I don't think we should move forward with the formal RFP because that to me um, has a lot of uh, negative um, consequences, including and most especially time. Um, number two, um, I, I, I agree that. Um, that we should be respectful of the the legalities and the, the concerns regarding the nonprofit status of the foundation. I'm not that kind of lawyer, but there's got to be a way to figure that out because it's happened in other cities before. Um, we, we have an opportunity to go visit one of these facilities that are working alongside a foundation that has centered its mission around stranding. And to the vice mayor's point, we don't know what we don't know. So, and time is of the essence. So um, I, to me, that looks like the last option is the competitive direct negotiations. 
negotiations being just that. You can enter into an agreement or you can walk away and then we're going to have to figure out what to do if we're kind of left with a, you know, left with no partner going forward. Um, so, so I, I think you should send people out to view these facilities and, and yeah, it's, you know, it's, it, it, it's one of those things where, you know, you're sending public officials to a far away place and people will poke fun at us over that. And it's unfortunate, but I mean, we just got to do it. And, you know, and, and yeah, I know it's budget season and, and people don't like us traveling and, um, including my wife and kids, but, um, so anyway, that's all I got. Okay, Michael, and then uh, uh, let's wrap it up. I think that was well said, Josh. Thank you. <laughs> um, I guess I have two, two things. Mm -hmm. The first one is, and Vice Mayor Wilson really addressed it, but I want to really drill down further because in no conversation that I have ever heard or participated in has it been contemplated that the city of Virginia Beach is selling the aquarium? And yet, and I think you were very kind, Monica, to suggest that there's been balanced media coverage, and yet there are actual media reports indicating that the city is contemplating selling the aquarium. And I, I, I'm not aware of that as any option that anyone has ever discussed and I want to really caution the media and the public and the foundation and the members of the community and the staff against using that term because it's not an accurate reflection, I think, of what is being discussed. Would you agree with that, Mr. Dane? I think um, I think the council is not willing to transition the aquarium in a place where somebody could change the use from an aquarium, right? I think the council is interested in maintaining the assets, the benefits but trying to get the obligations and the liabilities off of the city coffers and the city books because of the myriad of all the other needs that you all have, right? Um, I don't think the council wants to sell the land. I do think transitioning the facilities and the operations is something that we're interested in if it makes sense for all the parties concerned, right? I think ideally the council would like to get the economic impacts and the benefits associated with the aquarium have control over the land in case anybody wanted to change the, um, the use of it, and then also keep a modicum of research, education, community outreach, and stranding in Virginia Beach, right? That's what I hear from you all, right? That can happen in a myriad of different ways. Obviously, we're interdependent on the foundation, so they'll likely have to be on board with it some way, shape, or form. If they're not on board with it, that will be communicated to council. At no point right now is anybody asking council to make a decision on transitioning ownership is just now a conversation out in the public about do we continue to explore it? And I think we should explore it because I'm not hearing any consensus on spending a significant amount of money on this and the myriad of other needs that you all have. Plus, we all agree that the status quo is unsustainable. So I like to go on a path of exploring all the options, including talking fever, feverishly and earnestly with the foundation to get them on board. And if I could just at this forward, you know, I think I like the idea of a concurrent track because of them also the multiple sites and this way the foundation could actually begin that, you know, uh, you know, negotiation, you know, uh, step uh, and get to know each other and get to know the players on, you know, on both of the proposals and you know, and I think that would put us on a far, far uh, better foothold about what we're trying to, uh, you know, achieve. Ultimately, we have, you know, I think the end game is the survival and success of the aquarium. And that's what we have to get to. It's how we get there still to be determined. Okay. Okay. Thank you all. Very, uh, thank you for that. Appreciate it. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. All right. So, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, you want to you want to go to the budget conference? We got now it's time for the budget presentations, but you want to take another break? Okay, okay. You might, let's take a five minute break. <laughs> Can we take a five five minute break? Okay, cool.
gonna make a quick. We're gonna go make. Ahead, a, get going. Yeah, we're gonna make a quick adjustment to the schedule. We're gonna knock some of these off and move them to the next week. All right. But right now, we're gonna have the plan department give an overview of the planning items that will come to you for April second and the sixteenth. Then after that, we'll move into the budget presentations. All right. So go ahead, Caitlin. This floor is yours. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of Council. As usual, I'm here this afternoon to give a brief overview of the planning items on your April 2nd and April 16th City Council meetings. There is only one item for consideration on your April 2nd agenda. This is a request for a CUP for an outdoor recreational facility located on, the out, on an out parcel of the Lynn Haven Mall. The applicant intends to operate a 40,000 square foot inflatable park on a seasonal basis from March through September with an existing parking lot of the mall. Proposed hours of operation are 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. seven days a week. The park will consist of four inflatables, each of which will be deflated at the close of business every day. The park is proposed to be enclosed with a six foot tall chain link fence covered in black mesh to provide a defined perimeter of the park. While staff generally does not support the use of chain link fencing, since the proposed use is temporary in nature and will not be permanently installed on the site, staff is agreeable to its use in this application. The site will continue to meet the overall parking requirement despite the park itself occupying 142 spaces. While staff had originally conditioned the use of amplified speakers solely for general announcements, the Planning Commission was in favor of allowing music as well as requested by the applicant. The applicant did reach out to the residents who live on the opposite side of South Lynn Haven Road to make them aware of the request, as well as their intention to request permission to play amplified music. Based on the feedback provided by the applicant, none of the residents they spoke with had any concerns regarding the proposal. Ultimately, the Planning Commission did vote to recommend approval of the request with the modified condition to add amplified music. Yes. Fun box. Are they established that they're illegitimate? Yes. I mean, yeah, they have. Not, not to question, but that's important. Yeah, they have several locations nationwide. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. They're yeah, actually, sure. actually uh, residents of uh, District 9. So the, the individuals are, their family. They're family. Virginia Beach family. Yeah. yeah. Just, just want to vouch for <laughs> Moving on to your April 16th agenda, there are a total of 13 planning items for consideration. Item one is an ordinance to amend section 111 of the city zoning ordinance pertaining to the definition of several terms. This amendment is intended to provide clarity and consistency within the zoning ordinance specifically related to the definitions of home sharing, dwelling unit, kitchen, and porch. With regards to the definition of home sharing, the amendment proposes to replace the term dwelling with dwelling unit within the definition. Staff has found there to be too much ambiguity in what is meant by the term dwelling, since there are several different types of dwellings, such as single family, duplex, townhomes, etc. One particular issue staff has faced when determining if a use is considered a home share was with regards to duplexes, where a property owner owns both units, residing in one unit, and then renting out the other for a period of less than 30 days. When originally contemplating the definition of home sharing, it was the intention for the owner to reside within the same unit rather than the adjacent unit. Therefore, if we replace dwelling with dwelling unit, that provides that additional clarity as to what was initially intended. Another proposed change with this amendment is the definition of a dwelling unit itself, replacing the term housekeeping unit with residence. Since the term housekeeping unit is not defined in the zoning ordinance, nor is it an overly common term. So replacing it with the term residence will provide clarity that a dwelling unit constitutes an independent residence for a family, and then there again, better aligns with what was intended by the term. Another change proposed is related to the definition of a kitchen, again, replacing the term housekeeping unit with dwelling, and to specify that a kitchen must contain permanent provisions for cooking, such as an oven or a stove. And then finally, uh, the proposed amendment would add a definition of a porch, which is currently only defined within the Oceanfront Resort District form-based code. Um, including this definition in the ordinance will just add consistency between the two documents. The Planning Commission did vote unanimously in favor of the proposed amendment at their March hearing. Item two is a street closure request for the remaining portion of an unimproved right-of-way east of 2375 Virginia Beach Boulevard. 
More specifically, the applicant is requesting to close the remaining 813 square feet of a 30 foot wide unimproved right of way and incorporate that portion into their adjacent auto dealership. Council did approve the closure of the majority of this right of way at your February 20th hearing. However, this portion was referred back to planning commission for reconsideration due to an error with the legal ad. A viewers meeting was held on October 20th of 2023 to consider the closure request. And at that time, the viewers determined that there was no, that the proposed closure would not result in any public inconvenience and therefore had no objection to the closure. Staff is unaware of any opposition and the planning commission did vote unanimously in favor of the item by consent. Items three and four include a conditional rezoning request from conditional B2 and conditional I, to conditional I1 in conjunction with the CUP for a bulk storage yard for property located at 1585 Damneck Road. The applicant intends to rezone the parcel to conditional I1 in order to construct a 21,000 square foot office warehouse building with a bulk storage yard in order to store equipment associated with Dominion Energy's transmission operations in the area. While Damneck Road is access controlled, temporary access will be provided from Damneck until the construction of Twin Mills Road to the west is complete. After that time, the Damneck Road access will be closed and a continuous one foot no ingress egress easement will be dedicated along the entire frontage of the site. The outdoor storage area will be screened by a six foot tall opaque fence with category six landscaping and existing vegetation on the site will be retained to provide additional landscaping and buffering of the property. The proposed office warehouse use as well as the bulk storage yard are consider considered compatible uses within the greater than 75 decibel noise zone. Staff has not received any opposition to the request and this was recommended for approval by the planning commission on their consent agenda. Items five through nine include a modification of conditions, two conditional rezonings and two subdivision variances for property located at 1445 North Great Neck Road and 2307 Millwood Road, both of which are currently zoned R10. The church Wycliffe Presbyterian is requesting a modification of conditions to remove a 3.88 acre portion of the property from the CUP for a religious use that was granted by city council in 1966. The other applicant, BHC LLC, is requesting to conditionally rezone 2.43 acres of the parcel to conditional 01 and 1.45 acres to conditional R10. Access to the proposed conditional 01 and conditional R10 parcels will be via a shared private road from Millwood Road. All right, so focusing first on the proposed conditional 01 parcel, the proffered conceptual plan shows the retention of the existing pond as well as the 3,500 square foot building, which would have the option to add an addition of up to 500 square feet in size in the future if desired. 10 foot wide landscape buffers are proposed between the proposed 01 parcel and the adjacent residential properties of Great Neck Estates, which includes the retention of much of the existing vegetation. There are also buffers proposed between the proposed conditional 01 parcel and the proposed conditional R10 parcel. Oh, wait a minute. Chris had a question and then uh, Rosemary. Yes, I think it's more for the manager. I forwarded you several <laughs> emails uh, from concerned citizens about the signage. The, uh, there were signs that were supposed to be up. They weren't up. You all had received pictures. Was there any follow up to that? So we have in the pictures that we have been sent, it does show that the signs were posted on the property. Granted, there were some times where, you know, the signs might have slid down the stake or rotated. We have worked with the applicant to get those corrected as soon as possible. Um, ultimately, because this concern was raised prior to planning commission as well, um, it was really up to planning commission and then this body to determine whether proper notification has been provided. Um, we also provide notification in other ways in terms of uh, mailings to adjacent property owners and then legal advertisements that are run in the paper. Um, but we did get kind of updated pictures showing that those signs were, were reposted. Um, and again, some of them, they might have slid down the sign, but the sign was still on the property. Thank you. Hey, um, if the office part was taken out, could the houses be built by right? Yeah, so, so they could. 
Um, so the CUP would st modification to the CUP would still be required to remove this 3.8 acre portion out of the CUP for the religious use. If that is done, the underlying property is still zoned R10, so they could still develop under that by right zoning. Um, as long as they can meet the dimensional requirements for the R10 zoning district. We still have to come to the council to remove For the modification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Michael. Sorry. Um, for the, sorry, what is, it's 01, is that what it's being? So this, the 2.43 acres is proposed to go to conditional 01. Conditional 01. And what are, what are the conditions? Those are the conditions that are listed there. So the full, so with the conditional rezoning, there actually are proffers that are associated with that. Um, so what I called out here in terms of that bottom bullet there, they are, so they aren't just allowing all of the uses that would be allowed in the 01 district. They are further proffering the uses that would be permitted on this site. Um, this is just listing a couple, so medical, dental offices, professional offices, so think a law firm, engineering firm, or a nonprofit or religious uses. So they have further kind of tailored the uses that would be allowed within the 01 district down to ones that they feel would be most compatible with the adjacent residential properties. And there's currently, there's an existing building. Correct. And that's kind of an A-frame structure. Correct. What if, if this is rezoned, including the conditional, with the conditional, and the conditional rezoning and the proffers, what would be the what would be possible? Would it be would they be would it be possible to put a new building there? And what would that new building? What would be the height limitations, size? What what could or would that building look like? Sure. If that were to so occur, I'll answer that in kind of a couple different parts. So part of the benefit in terms of going through a conditional rezoning process is that the concept plan that is being shown, the elevations that are being shown, are part of the council approval. So any mod future modification of that would be required to come back through this process as a modification. So as long as it's not in substantial conformance with, if this is approved, what council has approved, it would be required to come back through the public hearing process. Um, in the example you gave in terms of if the existing A-frame building is demolished and they propose a new structure, that would be considered a substantial deviation and it would have to come back through this process. So as it's proposed, they're retaining the A-frame building as is with the option to add up to a 500 square foot addition in the future if they desire. But in terms of a complete demo rebuild, that would have to come back through this process. <coughs> and in terms of the height that you mentioned, um, right now it would be, again, what's shown here, I will just point out that the maximum height in the 01 district is 35 feet. That's equivalent to the maximum height allowed in, a re in the residential districts that are adjacent to this site. Which is how high, high a house could be. Correct, 35 feet. Um, getting back to what the vice mayor asked, if, if the 01 were taken out of play and it was our town, um, there could conceivably be a CUP sought for religious use if the uh, A-frame remained and mm -hmm. that was what the property owner intended to do. Would they would they need a variance because it's not three acres if it's a religious use? So yeah, that would require a deviation since religious use religious uses do require a minimum of three acres according to our ordinance. Okay, and in this particular iteration, they are proposing to um, keep the pond in place. Correct. Um, if, 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 by what mechanism are they doing that? Are, are they putting, are they, is it a, some sort of conservation easement or is there some sort of? It would be, because this, this plan that they're showing would be part of the proffers which are legally recorded, so it would relate the proffers that get recorded refer to the concept plan that is shown. And so any future, if they did decide to modify or fill in that pond, we would consider that a deviation from what is approved and require it to come back through this process. Hey, Chris. Any 
clarify for the public who the applicant is? Is it the church or the developer? Both. So it's Wycliffe <coughs> Presbyterian Church. They are requesting to remove the 3.88 acres from the CUP that was granted in 1966 for the religious use. And then the second applicant, BHC LLC, is requesting the two conditional rezonings and the subdivision variances. So they're joint applicants. And is staff that. aware that they currently don't own the property? Yes. Which okay. isn't, it's not uncommon. Um, a lot of times, potential purchases, purchasers want to go through this process before they <coughs> finalize on the sale, just because they don't want to move forward if they're not. The reason I bring that up is open space declined to uh, support this because they said they typically don't negotiate with individuals that aren't the property owner. Correct. So as a staff, we're working with someone that's not the property owner. They're going through the church. I just want to make sure the public understands open space did take a position based on the premise that they typically do not negotiate with someone that doesn't own the property yet. This application is being brought forth by the church that has an agreement with a developer who doesn't yet own the property. Correct. Thank you. All right. So while the zoning ordinance states that uses permitted in the 01 districts are intended to provide an environment compatible with residential uses, the applicant has further proffered the allowable uses for the 01 parcel, as I previously mentioned. So those uses could include the medical dental office, um, engineering firm, law firm, nonprofits, religious uses, those sort of things. So they're further tailoring down the list of uses that would be permitted in that A-frame building. Uh, a complete set of the proffered uses can be found in Proffer 5 in the staff report. The subdivision variance is required for the proposed 01 parcel since it does not meet the minimum 50-foot lot width requirement. <coughs> While the actual lot width is about 65 feet, since our ordinance does, does not permit the, any easement over 20 feet in width from being used to calculate the lot width requirement, the existing 30-foot dominion easement on the property cannot be considered when you're calculating that width. The applicant is currently working with Dominion to reduce the width of that easement to be 20 feet or less. However, that has not been finalized to date. Moving on to the 1.45 acre portion of the property known as Parcel R, this is proposed to be developed with a five lot single family subdivision. As part of the proffered plan, the applicant is including a 10 foot landscape buffer as well as a six foot tall privacy fence along both Millwood Road and North Great Neck. Since the ordinance typically only allows a four foot fence when you're within 30 feet of a public right of way, the applicant is requesting a deviation to allow for that height to go up to six feet. The placement of the proposed fence has been reviewed by our traffic engineering group and they determined that the location of the fence would not impact the required site distance from the Millwood Road, Great Neck Road intersection. The applicant has also worked with the fire department throughout this process to ensure that the design of both the private road and the private driveway do meet their requirements in terms of access. Since this, this road is proposed to be private, private trash collection versus public collection would be required in this instance. The applicant will also dedicate a one foot no ingress <coughs> egress easement along the entire frontage of North Great Neck Road. Good question. Can you explain that to the public, the, the need for the private trash collection? So will these five homes not pay? Uh, I know we're looking at a proposed increase of $3 in some sense. Do they not pay? Uh, how does that work since it's going to be privately handled? I'm not sure on the billing side of things, but it is city's practice typically when you're when you don't have access from a public road that we wouldn't provide public collection. But I'm not sure about the billing side of things. <coughs> Mr. Taylor, I'll look into that, Councilmember Taylor. Um, I can't, I'm not sure if they pay or not, but let me look into that. I'll verify for you. This is a unique situation. I think there's a couple of times in your district this has come up as well, too, especially on a couple of other items. But let me get some information. We'll share it to Council in the package. I, I, I want to say that they don't, but I could be wrong. So let me, Thank you. Let me check to make Thank sure. you. The parcels, parcels will be served by public water and sewer with services extending from Millwood Road and North Great Neck. The flag lot proposed for lot five, which does require that subdivision variance for both lot width and street line frontage, that will allow that connection to be extended from North Great Neck Road. 
The subdivision <coughs> ordinance does require an 8% open space for proposed residential subdivisions with lot sizes ranging from 10,000 square feet to 14,999 square feet. Based on the proposed subdivision, a little over 5,000 square feet of open space would be required to serve the five proposed lots. Section 4.5B of the subdivision regulations allows for the open space requirement to either be waived or for other alternatives to be considered when the required open space is less than an acre in size and would serve no useful public purpose. In this case, the applicant is requesting for council to consider a cash in lieu of payment in place of the dedicated open space. If approved, the amount of that open, that payment would be determined during the site plan review process and Parks and Rec would be bring the final terms of that agreement back to city council in accordance with the city's cash in lieu of policy. And that would of course include that final payment amount. The funds would then be allocated to Parks and Rec who would identify park improvements within that same planning area for which to allocate those funds. A five foot tall monument sign is proposed for the conditional 01 parcel only. This sign will be externally illuminated with the overall design conforming to the rendering shown on the left side of the screen. The image on the right shows one of the five proffered elevations for the proposed residential lot and the applicant has further proffered that the same plan will not be constructed on two adjoining lots. Overall, staff has received two letters of concern and 19 letters of opposition for this application, stating concerns related to a lack of open space, flooding, stormwater, and then the use of that existing office building for office uses. One speaker did speak in support of, and then 10 spoke in opposition to at the Planning Commission hearing in March. At the hearing, the motion to recommend approval of the application did fail by a vote of five for and five against, and thus the recommendation moves forward from the commission as a denial. Item 10 is an application for a subdivision variance to section 4.4B of the subdivision regulations for property located at 2620 Broad Bay Road. <clears throat> this R10 parcel was established by a plat in March of 1952 prior to the adoption of both the subdivision and zoning ordinances and is currently developed with a single family dwelling. The applicant is requesting to subdivide the property to create two residential lots. While the proposed lots will meet most of the dimensional requirements for the R10 district, they will be just shy of the 80 foot lot width required. Proposed lot 8A as shown will be deficient in lot width by 0 0.97 feet <laughs> and proposed lot 8B will be deficient in lot width by 1.49 feet, <laughs> thus requiring the variance. Since the subdivision regulations do require a 50 foot right of way and the current right of way width along this section of Broad Bay Road is 40 feet, the applicant is proposing a five foot wide right of way reservation that will be recorded prior to the developments of these lots. <laughs> Staff believes that the proposed building elevations provide high quality and attractive buildings that will be compatible with the variety of housing styles and lot sizes in this area. Staff also notes that there have been several subdivision variances that have been approved previously in both the Broad Bay Colony and Broad Bay Point neighborhoods, either to allow for reduction in the lot width or for the creation of new lots that do not have access to a public street. Staff has received seven letters of support and 30 letters of opposition for this application, and there were a total of three speakers present in opposition at the Planning Commission hearing. Those in opposition did express concerns with how these will change the look and the feel of the neighborhood, a decrease in property values, and then the effect for privacy for surrounding neighbors. Ultimately, the Planning Commission did vote to recommend approval of this item by a vote of eight to two. Item 11 is an application for a modification of proffers. This is for property located at the southeastern corner of the Virginia Beach Boulevard, North Oceana Boulevard intersection. As you may recall, the City Council approved a modification of proffers in 2023 to allow the property to be developed with an office warehouse building. It is still the applicant's intent to develop an approximately 41,000 square foot building. However, they seek to modify proffers two and three to allow for an increase in the building height from 26 feet to 35 feet in order to allow for additional <coughs> storage space inside the building. To offset this increase in building height, the applicant is proposing to enhance the landscape buffer 
adjacent to the residential properties to the south and the east to include a mix of large shrubs, understory trees, and canopy trees, which will have a mature height of between 12 to 35 feet. In addition to the increase in height, the updated building elevations include additional and larger windows to break up the mass of the exterior facade. The hours of operation are still proposed to be 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. daily. Staff is unaware of any opposition to the request and the Planning Commission did vote in favor of the item at their March hearing. Item 12 is a CUP for a short-term rental for property located at 303 Atlantic Avenue, Unit 403. More specifically, the request is for a two-bedroom unit within the Dolphin Run condominiums. There are no past or current zoning violations associated with this unit, and there have been a total of nine STR CUPs previously approved for the condominiums. Since Dolphin Run is one of those properties that was granted a historical exemption for parking, only one parking space is required for this use. Staff has not received any opposition to the request and the Planning Commission did vote unanimously in favor of the item by consent. The final item on your April 16th agenda is not an item that's coming to you from the Planning Commission, but rather is an appeal of a decision by the Historical Review Board related to the partial denial of a certificate of appropriateness for Building 3, which is the former City Hall. While the applicant for the appeal is Public Works, I did want to take time today just to make you aware of the request coming forward, but they will be available at the April 16th meeting to pre present their case and answer any questions. Since Building 3 is located within the Courthouse Historic and Cultural District, a certificate of appropriateness must be reviewed and approved by the Historical Review Board prior to starting any exterior work on a structure. The subject certificate of appropriateness application was for an after the fact <coughs> approval for the alteration of three window openings on the east elevation and the removal of the natural slate roof to be replaced with a synthetic slate. The initial certificate of appropriateness for the building was approved in January of 2022. However, the scope of that COA did exclude any work or alterations to the roof. When planning staff noticed that the slate was removed from the building back in November, we did make contact with Public Works to make them aware of the need for that after the fact COA and an application for which was, a, was filed for in December. This item was heard by the Historical Review Board at their December 20th hearing. And while the alterations of the three window openings were approved since the intention for those was to be um, restored back to their original dimensions, the request for the replacement of the natural slate roof with synthetic slate was denied. This denial was based on the fact that Building 3 is considered a contributing resource to the National Register Historic District, with the slate roof being a major character-defining feature. Additionally, the board felt that the synthetic slate would be an inappropriate replacement since it does not conform with the Secretary of the Interior's standards for rehabilitation and the uniformity of the synthetic slate's appearance and then the way that product ages does not match its natural counterpart. It also has a far shorter life expectancy, lifespan, sorry, with um, about 30 to 50 years versus 60 to 120 years for the natural slate. One thing I did want to note, synthetic slate was used both on this building as well as former building two, now building 11, but neither of those structures are considered contributing resources to the district. Additionally, the synthetic slate used on those buildings has since been discontinued. So what is proposed for this building, while similar, is not an exact match to what has been used on the other two buildings. Another thing I wanted to note is that cost is not an included criteria for the approval of certificate of appropriatenesses per section 1303 of the ordinance. And as such, that was not a factor the board could consider when they were making their evaluation of the proposal. Again, Public Works will be present at the April 16th hearing to discuss their request to use the synthetic slate product and how that factors into the overall project cost and timeline for Building 3. Mr. Mayor, yeah. members of Council, we, I typically don't get involved with this one, but this one is particularly our asset. Obviously, the planning, um, the Historic Preservation Board can't consider cost. That's something that is germane to us, but also 
if we have to go buy real slate, from my understanding, that's going to significantly delay the time for us to um, finish the building, and it'll push back us from a um, critical path standpoint, which may mean a delay in actually moving the staff in there. LJ will be there to present and discuss that more at length with you all, but I just want you all to have that context as well as you consider this. Okay. And that does wrap up my briefing, so if there's any questions, I can certainly answer those. Okay, thanks a lot. So, Mr. Mayor. Okay, folks, if we could pay, folks, if we could pay attention, please. Yep. So, Mr. Mayor, just do the timing. We're going to um, cut. And we're not, when I say cut, we're going to move them to the next meeting. So they're still going to get their time they'll get before you and make their ask and their requests and complain about my proposal. Right. So the fire department, the police department, emergency management and convention center are going to be moved to another briefing date. Public safety will likely be moved to the next briefing date. And the clerk of circuit courts, they weren't able to stay. So they'll likely be moved to another briefing date. Right. So right now we're what we're. No, sorry, my fault. The circuit court the judge. Circuit court. Yeah, not the clerk. The clerk's here. Um, but the Commonwealth Attorney, the clerk of circuit court, sure. sheriff and EMS will give you a, their budget presentation. And then the other four, will five, will move to a next meeting. Okay. All right. Sheriff, where we heard from. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir, Mr. Sheriff. Just your one, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Mr. Mayor, before the budget presentation gets kicked off, Kevin wants to have like a 30-second preamble before we move into the process. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Members of Council. So, um, obviously, I'm not the Commonwealth Attorney, but before the Commonwealth Attorney presents, so one of the things I just wanted to make note of is that there were a couple of organizational adjustments that occurred as part of the proposed budget. So, for example, uh, the parking enterprise funds being moved uh, proposed to be removed out of economic development and into the public works department so dollar for dollar economic development went down by a like amount and public works went up by that amount in terms of their proposed budget so similar to that i give that as an example a similar action occurred the proposed budget includes the removal of computer replacement and software uh, licensing out of the non-departmental section of the operating budget and reflects that in department specific operating budget based on their utilization of the software or their upcoming computer replacement needs. So it will look like in some of the slides, some of their operating accounts are growing uh, more so than the 2.77% uh, overall budget growth that I noted to city council just last week. But there's a there's a net change in that to where it's it's a wash through majority of the operating budget. So um, I just wanted to make note of that um, and try to give as much time back as we can. So uh, no questions on that. Then I'll turn it over to the Commonwealth Attorney. Hey, Colin, thank you for your patience. Absolutely. Anyone who's Government been at work, <laughs> sorry. anyone who's been to to court understands that it's impossible for us to guarantee a start time either. So uh, no, I'm used to used to uh, moving things around. Um, I just have a few brief remarks that shouldn't take more than an hour. And then, uh, uh, no. I, I know there's a lot of people here waiting and you've been through a lot already. Um, so I'm not gonna go through my PowerPoint. You have it in your presentations. Um, I, I do wanna talk just a little bit about um, some of the issues that, that we've gone through this past year and, and looking forward to next year as well. Um, you'll see in, in the budget, there that there is a uh, increase of uh, $825,000. Um, a large chunk of that is actually from the state. The, the pay grades for the attorneys were increased at the comp board level. That money was passed from the comp board down to, to the city. Um, my office uh, worked very closely with the city manager to try and not 
to have that money absorbed and instead be able to pass it on to the attorneys in my office to allow us to be um, competitive in the market because we're not only competing with other Commonwealth attorneys offices, but we're competing with private law firms and trying to retain the talent that we have. And, and really all the increase that you see there is, is personnel costs. Um, so um, one of the other things we've done this past year is we got a grant um, from Project Ceasefire to allow us to prosecute all um, concealed weapon charges in the city of Virginia Beach and that provided us for an additional attorney and a legal information clerk for, for the next three years with, with that funding. So um, unless there's any questions on, on the buzzer proposal, um, I'm happy to move into um, some of the bigger issues that, that we see coming in the next year. And, and one of the main things I want to highlight to you is VOCA funds. And I don't know how many people have heard about the uh, severe drop in VOCA funds on the federal level. But VOCA stands for uh, Victims of Crime Act. And it's not actually funded through any act of Congress. It is the fines and court costs and fees from federal prosecutions all go into the Victims of Crime Act fund. And that's how the federal government then funds all kinds of different services in the criminal justice system. So it would come from the federal government to DCJS. But not only is my victim witness program funded mainly from VOCA funds, but so many of the services provided in our community, like Samaritan House, receives an awful lot of funding from VOCA funds. Well, VOCA funds could uh, drop by 41% in the next year, simply because they do not have the funds going into there that they did before. Um, the National District Attorneys Association and Virginia Commonwealth Attorneys have been working with the congressional delegations to try and get Congress to step in and provide additional funding into that. But there could be severe cuts across the country in the criminal justice system and those agencies that, that assist a criminal justice system next year. Uh, and I just simply wanted to put that on, on your radar. Additionally, um, a lot of your city agencies over this next year are working very closely with the Virginia Beach Circuit Court and my office to try and establish a behavioral health docket, which uh, is extremely important, I, I think, for the citizens of Virginia Beach. Um, mental health is, is the biggest problem that, that we face in the criminal justice system. Mental health and substance abuse, and the two of those things go hand in hand often um, on there. And so I, I'm a firm believer in doing everything we can to try and get individuals the assistance that they need to, to become uh, productive citizens. And I know there's a lot of people waiting, so I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions or cover something that I haven't covered that any you questions? want to hear. Uh, thank you for your job you're doing. I know uh, with the increase of the body cameras and everything, it really put an increased load on you, but you are functioning magnificently as always. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Mayor, members of council, at this time, we'll be joined by the clerk of circuit court, Ms. Tina Sinnon, who's going to come and give an overview of her, um, of the proposed budget for her office. <coughs> Good afternoon, um, Mr. Dehaney, Mr. Sykes, Mayor Dyer, Vice Mayor Wilson, Honorable Council, thank you for having me this afternoon. And I'm also going to be very quick. Like Colin, you have my numbers in front of you. Um, they haven't changed much, which, which they never do, with the exception of costs like risk management, um, uh, employee costs as far as health insurance, and all, all of those things, and what Kevin said with the computer I think there was $125,000, um, somewhere along those lines, added also in my budget. Um, all of those are out of our control. Um, I will just point out some things that are not in the slide presentation. The clerk's office is pretty self-sufficient uh, with regard uh, to our uh, providing computer software and maintenance of that software. Um, almost 100% for our land record system, the electronic recording of land records, our court case management system, the electronic 
filing of civil suits and criminal procedures, the electronic docket board system so the public can find what courtroom they are in and what time their case is being heard, our electronic concealed carry permit program, making it easier for the public to apply and reapply for their permit. Um, that's just to name a few. Please keep in mind that the maintenance alone on those land record systems and the Supreme Court systems that we have costs right at about $500,000 per year, but currently there's really no cost uh, to the locality in using or in paying for those systems. And now more than ever, we know um, and have definitely experienced with these systems and how critical they are in providing services to the public um, when you can't come into a building to, to use and, and get that information. Um, with some of these systems, and, and uh, Mr. Duhaney and I have been over this, that we have saved the locality with over 250 users of this system within the city itself um, that we don't charge for over $2 million in the last several years. I have 57 full-time positions um, in our office. This past year has been a little tough. We've had about 10 folks retire, um, very tenured people. And um, combined, that was about over 200 years of experience walking out the door. So hiring and training is taking a lot of our time right now, doing, doing that with the hiring and training and still maintaining a level of service um, that is good for the public is challenging to say the least, and we're all facing that. Uh, we offer many services to the public. If you haven't used my office in the past, you will without a doubt at some point in your life use my office. We record all the land records in Virginia Beach, which consists of deeds, deeds of trust, powers of attorney, judgments, military discharges, um, which is the DD-214s, and we do that as a free service for our veterans. Um, we probate wills and estates. We handle the guardianships of incapacitated and uh, adults and minors, and that's just on the recording side. And we have this whole other very complex court side. Um, Judge Lewis said to say hello. Mm -hmm. um, we handle name changes, adoption, divorce, the larger size civil suits, the heinous criminal matters, adoptions, divorce, larger size civil suits, and everything that is appealed from the district courts. We have seven sitting circuit court judges in our court running a docket every single day. Um, jury, jury trials have taken up a lot of our time lately. Um, I do get excited talking about all that my office does. I believe we represent the city of Virginia Beach well. Um, my staff is good at what they do. Um, as you know, all the state funding I get is salary reimbursement for 52 FTEs, including some of the fringes. The city funding that I receive pays for five FTEs uh, and the daily operational costs to efficiently run my office. And I'm very grateful for that for my locality. Uh, we do our best to keep our actual operating costs very low, considering we are the second largest jurisdiction in the Commonwealth. Um, it is a budget that we've had for the last several years that continues to allow us to maintain an acceptable in my opinion, responsiveness with the workload to continue to serve our citizens of Virginia Beach well. And I uh, believe we help in our role of public safety to the community. I believe we have a big role in that public safety piece. Uh, the police uh, department does a great job of getting those off the street that need to be off the street. And the sheriff's department does a great job of housing those people and, and uh, rehabilitating some of those folks. And there's this big middle piece that we come into contact with that we have um, to get them from A to C. Um, so we do a lot um, with the public safety. I'm very thankful um, for realizing, uh, my city realizes that we do do a lot of core government services for our citizens. Um, and this is typically the time where I state that the Virginia Beach Clerk's Office is still an excess fee office. That's getting less and less um, lately uh, throughout the Commonwealth, but we are still an excess fee office. And what that really means is I make enough money with the fees that I charge to pay for my office as well as some of the offices throughout the Commonwealth. Um, so that means we are still a revenue provider for the locality as well as the state. Um, last year's been pretty hectic with losing all the folks that we've lost, but in, in my tenure right now, I knew that was ha happening or coming sooner or later. Uh, we're still trying to play catch up on the court side with many of the jury trials to catch up from the COVID years that we had. Um, it's still our rule that uh, customer service uh, is, is our main priority, and I, I think we try to and strive to do that every day. And um, thank you for all that you do to help the Circuit Court Clerk's Office do that. Um, and I can answer any questions that you might have any for questions? me. You know, getting through COVID had to be a major challenge for you, and the back, not only was. at the time, but the backlog. Thanks for everything, and please thank your crew. I will do. Thank you very much. All right, so Mr. Mayor, members of council, at this time, Sheriff Rocky Holcomb will come and present before city council the proposed budget for fiscal year 24-25. I 
know you from somewhere. Yeah. I, I tell you, I've never had this view. This is a good view over here. <laughs> so uh, good, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, Honorable Members of Council, City Manager, City Clerk, and City Attorney. Uh, I just talked to Monica, and she told me she left 30 minutes on the table from her aquarium presentation, so I'll go ahead and take that time up if you don't mind. Now, I want to go through what everybody else has talked, to, uh, talked about with Colin and, and Tina, and the, uh, the Sheriff's Office is pleased with our budget, and one thing that this, that this body has always done, and I'm always thankful for, is you've always held public safety harmless, and so we're very thankful for that because we know that to have a safe city, we have to have strong public safety. And if I could, real quick, let me, let me have some of my crime fighters from the sheriff's office. If you could stand up from the sheriff's office over there. I brought some crime fighters over here with me today so they could hear this budget. Thank you, guys. So let me talk about the body-worn cameras a little bit. I would venture to say that with the body-worn cameras that we have implemented in our department, if you ask my deputy sheriffs to go to work without a camera, they would refuse to do it. That's how successful the cameras are. In fact, we've seen a 25% reduction in assaults on staff with the, with the body cameras. And so we are so thankful to this body for letting us purchase those. I guess it was last year that we made a decision to get them, but the body cameras are, uh, are a big plus. And if I could go on to talk about, and you have the slide deck there, it's the... Uh, this is page five where we're talking about major changes and initiatives. So one of the things we need to keep our eye on over the horizon is the medical vendor. So we, we are at about $8 million right now with an escalator of probably about $300,000 each year. But let me tell you this, and, and uh, Commonwealth Attorney talked about it and so did the clerk. We are seeing an aging population coming to jail with many problems, and those problems are being treated with drugs and alcohol, and then when they get to us, they get cleaned up and we find out just how bad their medical problems are. And, and the second thing is the mental health issue. We've identified almost 63% of our inmate population in need of some uh, mental health help. And we're making sure we get them those wraparound services so that when they get out, they can have the same type of treatment we're giving them on the inside. But folks, I can tell you this, as we stand here in 2024, this mental health problem is not going away and it, it's, only, it's only increasing. And I think that we certainly need to give it all the time and attention that we can. Uh, a, we have an aging facility. Our, our jail came online in the 70s. It's a 24-hour operation, and it's, it's, show, it's starting to show its age. So what myself and my staff are working on is alternative forms of incarceration. We would like to see more electronic home monitoring. We'd like to see more work release. We would like to see folks getting out and being incarcerated in the community on one of those programs versus being in our, in our correctional center. Now, if you could shift to page slide five, uh, slide six. Recruitment efforts, working every day to reduce vacancies. This is a huge problem in, in law enforcement right now that we're all facing. And uh, we're, we're certainly doing the best we can to recruit folks. We have uh, 34 sworn vacancies right now, and we have 15 civilian vacancies. And I can tell you this, our working relationship with the chief of police and the police department is unbelievable. We have such a great working relationship with them, and we're really combining a lot of our efforts to save money and make this a safer city. Now, we'll move to the alternative sentencing program. That's what I talked about with electronic home monitoring, work release, and things like that, where we can get folks out in the community. And the one that we're really drilling down on in the next one, expanding our Road to Hope programs. So here's what we understand, that we have 1,000 prisoners in our jail. 29% of them are violent offenders. The rest of them are going to land in our communities. They're going to be in District 1 through 10, I promise you. And so we want to make sure that we give them some good skills and abilities so that when they get back out into the community, that they can make a difference in being a productive citizen. And under this Road to Hope program, we have several initiatives that we started. We have a uh, landscape service certification. We have a food service certification. We have GED programs. We're encouraging everybody that comes in, if you don't have a GED, get one. We're, we have a life learning program where we can teach decision-making skills, and hopefully we can transition these folks back into the community and they can be productive citizens. And we may be coming to you again about this for some funding on some programs that we have, but we are excited about this Road to Hope program, and we're going to make a difference in Virginia Beach. We call it the Virginia Beach Correctional Center. Well, we're going to see if we can put some correctional in that and get folks back out in the community and, and be productive. Now, the, the last thing I want to talk about, and I dropped this on you late, and I understand 
that the, the funding is few and the needs are many, but I've been approached about the DARE program. And a couple of weeks ago, and it should have a, 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 a pa I passed out a, a presentation of what the program looks like. So I've been approached about this DARE program and getting it back in, in the schools. So the DARE program was disbanded because of funding in 2015. Now the DARE curriculum has changed. And when you think about DARE, you, you think about the drug resistance. Well, it, it is that, it is that, but it's a lot more than that. We talk about risk and consequences, peer pressure, dealing with stressful situations, basics of communication, nonverbal communication and listening, bullying, helping others, getting help from others, and reviewing that help from others. These are important things that I think we can all agree are good decision-making skills that we give our young people at an early age. We, we talk about how we want to make a difference, and it's not just drugs. We're seeing increasing gang members in our jail. We have a rising number of gang members, and I can promise you if they're in our jail, they're in our community. So I hope that you can give this some consideration. It is going to take some funding. There's a startup cost, and then there's a maintenance cost yearly, obviously. But I do think that if we give this program a shot, we check a lot of boxes. We check the boxes of having a deputy sheriff in the, in the elementary schools. We check a box of teaching these young people, these young students, that law enforcement's here to help, that the community's here to help them, and that we can make a difference in their lives. So that was fast and furious, kind of a 20,000 foot view. One, one other thing that, that's interesting, when Council Member Hutch was the fire chief, I sat in the chair he sat in for his last budget, and now he sits in my chair for my first budget. So I think, and it wasn't planned. It wasn't planned that way. It just happened. So I want to take, uh, I want to thank the city manager and his staff for their hard work on this budget. And, uh, and again, I want to thank this body for their unwavering support to public safety. And uh, it, it means the world to us, and, and the citizens understand it. We got to keep a safe, a safe community. And I will welcome any questions. Any questions at all? <laughs> yes, yes, ma'am. But um, I do have two questions where you mentioned about the aging population. Yes. Coming into jail. Yes. Yeah, we're starting to see over 55, a lot more folks in the over 55 age coming into incarcerated on different charges. And then when you get that population in, it presents some different challenges to the staff as they come in. So we're, we're working through that. Okay, and the cost for monitors, because you mentioned about yeah. How does that impact the family, having that person back with mom? Yeah, we're working through a contract right now where we can find a fair price to make sure that they can pay that price. But right now, it costs $120 to $150 a day to keep one person in my jail. So that's what we're on the hook for, $120 to $150 every day to keep a person in jail. So I'm not sure what the cost would be. The, the program we have now is not being utilized, and we're trying to find the best, the best vendor to, to make it affordable so we can get people out. Okay, and last thing you mentioned about the DARE program. Yes, ma'am. And deputies. Yes, ma'am. How much time does that take away or what from them doing what they normally do? Right. We're, we're ready to create the complete DARE program. We're ready to dedicate 10 deputies and a supervisor to that program immediately and, and, and have those dedicated just to that program to serve the 55 elementary schools. So we're ready to do that heavy lift if we need to. Thank you. Thank you. And you have the funding in the budget for your dare? No, ma'am, did yes, not, did not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Henley, it can't, listen, I only got sworn in September 29th. I, I just hit the ground running. But I, I do understand the need for that, I do. And, and no, I, I don't have the funding in, it, in there. So this would be an additional cost to it, what you have in the budget? It now. would, yes, ma'am, it would, to the $69 million. 1.9. Right. Yeah, 1.9 startup, and then it's 1.1 per year. The startup is we got to get everything back up and running, the vehicles, the equipment, everything that we need to get the 10 deputy sheriffs out into the schools. Okay, now, uh, Chris and then I'm um, young. Yeah. Sheriff Holcomb, good yes, to see sir. you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, last week you assisted you with the mentorship program that yes, we sir. have in District 8, and I wanted to know, being that things are so tight, I got excellent feedback from the boys yesterday. Thank you, Council Member. Um, about uh, what you all talked about. Yes, sir. And what they learned, and they learned they don't want to go to jail. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, but if, as as tight as this is, is there any is there any room in here to reduce? I mean, do you need ten? Could you, if you had to jumpstart this, could you? I mean, yes, sir. Pilot program. I mean, we want to support you, but yes, you've been sir. doing this mentorship program for eight years, and eight 
for zero. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. And, and that's a good question. Yeah, it's a good question. And we 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 can do a scaled down version and 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 adjust as we need it. Uh, I think to have anything successful out there, we need at least five. And so, but that's a that's a fair question. Yes, sir. And thank you. Thank you. Hey, Amelia. And just. On what I mentioned before, to do with the DARE program, have you talked with the school? I, I've, I've, I've been in communication with some of the members of the school board and the superintendent, and, and I have communicated with them. Yeah. Okay, Barbara. Well, in looking at your, uh, you would need 11 additional employees. Yes, ma'am. You've already got a lot of vacancies. We got 34. We got 34. Yeah. What if, we, what if we funded this for half a year? Would that... I mean, if I'm looking at $2 million we've got to come up with, yeah. but I mean, if, you, if you've got to hire these people and you've already got a lot of vacancies, you're not, are you really going to be ready to go with this July 1? We can be. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Hanley. We're, we're working on some very aggressive recruitment, recruitment tools, and we have a new academy class that's coming in that's probably going to cut that 34 in about half. So we're, we're looking at some things that we can adjust fire on and maybe and maybe get the bodies we need. But we're we're ready to do the heavy lift for the community with this program. But you get make very valid points. Okay, Rocky, thanks a bunch. Thank you. I appreciate you. It's a, it's a good view over coming. here. Appreciate it. So, Mr. Mayor, members of council, at this time, Chief Stroud will present the EMS proposed budget for fiscal year 24 25. And again, he'll be the last budget presentation. We're moving the other ones to another week. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of council, staff, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I was hoping I could grab the sheriff on his way out because he's so well loved. I was gonna ask him if he could do this for me and hopefully get a little more favor. But um I think it's sitting through the presentations you sat through today. I don't know if it's um if I'm lucky or not to be the last one you get today. Uh, but I do appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm gonna go through my first couple slides relatively quickly because I know you have the slide deck and I know um it's a lot of numbers for you. Um, so what I do want to make sure, though, that I point out as you're looking at this, like, like most city departments, our staff personnel related costs are our number one expense. I also would remind you that primarily 94% of our departmental funding is general fund oriented. And um, this budget is inclusive of the new $4 million lifeguard contract that we talked about several months ago. That's a calendar year cost of $4 million with $3 million um, needing to be paid over the course of this fiscal year with 1 million from the tip. Um, so it's been a very busy year. We've had a lot of transition. This council has been very supportive of EMS, um, not only the last two years, but well over the years, but certainly the last year or two, you've given a lot of positions. We spent a lot of time filling those positions. You onboarded um, me, your new chief, um, several new deputy chiefs, an accountant. We converted a medic position to an accountant, a new recruiter position, payroll specialist, which you provided in the last budget and several responder positions. Um, I think an important thing I'd like to point out for you is that for the first time in three years, we did not end the year with a net loss of volunteers. So COVID really did an impact on volunteerism um, as it did for employers and, uh, and other not-for-profit entities. And so in 2023, we ended the year with a net gain of 17 new volunteers. Um, certainly would like that number to be much higher, but if you take into consideration the previous two years, we had a net loss. Um, that's, you know, so that's a turnaround in the right direction. I would tell you that the year we went into COVID in 2020, we ended the year with 420 volunteers that are capable of staffing ambulances, and now we're at 300. So we're still significantly impacted by that, that staffing decline. Um, however, with the resources you gave us last year, um, I was able to put a new staffing model in place with the assistance of staff, and um, we, we started demand staffing that allowed us to greatly um, allocate our resources to where the greatest need were during those busiest times of day. And, and so we're able to have periods of 16, 17 ambulances during those demand periods. We still struggle with some of the nighttime weekends and shoulder times. Um, also, while I'm up here, I'd be remiss if I didn't also seize the opportunity to publicly thank EMS staff, our volunteer rescue leadership, my colleagues in the emergency response system and the city manager's office for their support and assistance throughout this year of transition. Yeah, Patrick. And Mr. Mayor, members of council, honestly, 
you all really need to just understand the magnitude of what you all did here with this investment, right? I mean, Chief Stroud said for the first time in a long time, we haven't um, lost volunteers, right? Working in collaboration with the Volunteer Rescue Councils, the squads, and the foundation, we've done a tremendous amount of work. And go back to the previous slide, Chief. Literally, we're adding four additional new ambulances where we get to the streets. Uh, you know, we've still got ways to go, right? But the investments that you all have done the past couple of years have have paid off. We're not done yet. we still got ways to go, but things are feeling like they're stabilizing, but there's still a lot of more work that is necessary to move forward on. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, so where do we need to go? So, so at a baseline, we need 18 ambulances staffed 24-7. And I, and I would like to share with you for a couple of minutes where we get that from. So a tried and true measure for our city over the years has been this idea that we need one ambulance per every 3,000 calls for service. Um, and that's, that's been that way since that metric has actually applied since the days of Bruce Edwards and, and then after that, that stayed a consistent constant. I will tell you that's similarly aligned with the city of Norfolk. The staff's one ambulance for every 3,111 calls. The city of Chesapeake. Um, actually staffs one ambulance for every 2,200 calls. Portsmouth, one ambulance for every 3,700 calls. And Henrico County, one ambulance for every 2,700 calls. We also then try to kind of checks and balance that approach to make sure that that um, makes sense for us. So we, we're also monitoring unit hour utilization, which is a measurement of work productivity or essentially how busy the ambulance crews are. The average unit hour utilization or, or time on actual incidents um, during our busiest demand period currently is averaging 65%. That's down from the mid 70s where it was and your efforts helped us do that with the resources you've given us. However, it's still about 20% higher than where it needs to be at least 90% of the time. Um, as we talk about increased unit hour utilization that stay above 45% for any length of time, we're talking about increased provider fatigue, burnout and decreased ambulance availability. In terms of response times, we then cross-check that. Our goal is to ensure an ambulance is on scene of our higher acuity calls, those priority one calls, in 12 minutes or less, at least 90% of the time. In 2023, we hit this goal 58% of the time, so obviously we still have some work to do. So to achieve this 18 ambulances 24-7, which is this baseline staffing we believe we need 24-7, um, we need to be able to staff three more ambulances above what the capacity of the system can currently provide us. The reality is in order to do that, we need a net gain of 150 volunteer members, 30 career providers, or any combination thereof. In our budget submission, the 16 providers we requested, in addition to the four that were able to be provided in the recommended budget, would have gotten us two of those three additional ambulances. I put that funnel on the right there. Some, some our stakeholders um, are always surprised to find out the attrition rate that goes into us trying to get volunteers. Um, so we cast the net very wide and large. You've probably seen some of the commercials or heard them late night on TV. Um, and we get a lot of people that check us out. They say, That's, I want to go do that. That sounds exciting. And so they go online and they create a profile. They have to create a profile before they can apply. So we count them as profilers. And we track all of these um, from beginning to end. And then as they learn about duty requirements, oh, you mean I actually have to commit to something? They learn about training requirements or they learn that driving record um, infractions can be a barrier or some of their criminal background can be a barrier, that attrition rate leads to that funnel effect. Um, so for us to get 50 uh, volunteer attendant in charges, which is what it takes to staff one ambulance with volunteers 24 seven, we had to start with 715 applicants. Um, so it's a pretty significant attrition rate. So why, you know, we talk staffing, 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 and we talk response time, you know, our utilization, availability. Um, but the, but the, another big reason staffing is so important is for the vitality of the volunteer rescue squad system. Um, unfortunately, the rescue council president, Mike McCracken, couldn't be here this evening, but he and I spent a good deal of time talking about these matters. I do believe he's reached out to you as well to um, try to meet with you about um, their included, their request that is included in our departmental budget. But as you see here, the reason I threw this in here is, is, is to kind of show how it's all related. So if our ambulance staffing gets decreased or, or if we have negative ambulance staffing, then the availability for ambulances to take the next call is decreased, um, which leads to lengthy response times. Increase, then that in turn impacts uh, workload, unit hour utilization, um, can lead to um, negative impacts to member satisfaction and member burnout, impact their health and wellness, um, and ultimately um, then be a, a negative driver to volunteer recruitment and retention through exit surveys, 
listening sessions, and member engagement cultural surveys. We hear time and time again from the volunteer members that the system's simply gotten too busy. It's quote unquote, not fun to run duties anymore and the expectations are too much. So I was able to lower, lower duty requirements for the volunteer to try to address that. That seems to have helped the retention rate to some degree. Um, but when, when the volunteers come and run duty, they wanna be able to provide service to their community. They wanna have an equitable contribution, um, and, but they also wanna be able to get dinner, take breaks, get some rest before they have to go to work the next day, and they wanna be able to have fun. There's a social aspect to this. They're giving their time for free. Um, so major changes and in initiatives, we're still struggling to try to maintain adequate baseline staffing levels. Certainly we're in a much better place than, we, than we've ever been, um, but I would remind you when I say we need 18 ambulances, that's for current call demand. We do believe um, our call for service growth annually is gonna slow back down to the pre-COVID rate of one to 2%. Um, however, that's still gonna co likely continue to increase as we have an aging community. Um, the size, scope, and impacts of our programs have grown immensely over the years, so has the need for more medical direction. You may not be aware, or maybe you are, EMS services are delivered under the oversight and through the licensure of an operational medical director. Ours is Dr. Stuart Martin, who, Dr. Martin, if you could wave, he's here with you this afternoon, um, who has served in that role for more than 25 years and started himself as a volunteer at the Virginia Beach Volunteer Rescue Squad. Um, the recommended budget before you includes a transition of his position from a contractual 12 hours a month to 20 hours per week, so a true 0.5. Um, part-time on-site medical director who also is the, serves as the medical director for the emergency medical dispatch system and with the uh, fire department's pre-hospital efforts as well. It's imperative we find ways to better care for our members. This includes their emotional, physical, and mental health and well-being. We've made great strides in this area through some grassroots member initiatives. However, we have limited expertise and capacity without additional resources. We did request a health and wellness coordinator similar to positions already filled in the police and fire departments and unfortunately that wasn't a, not able to be included in recommendation. Um, the EMS budget also includes the grant request from the Virginia Beach Volunteer Rescue Council for $800,000. The volunteer rescue squads are faced with rising equipment and supply costs without a correlated increase in donations. Um, on the, from a departmental perspective, we recommend consideration of this grant request and we continue to work with the Rescue Council to assess alternatives for continued sustainable EMS funding sources. And then, you know, if that wasn't enough, it's a oh wait, there's more. Um, we, we know we're gonna have increased costs um, in actual goods and labor due to having to assume some pharmaceutical supply program oversight um, and changes in the coming months. As we talk about, we've greatly increased ambulance staffing over the last several years. Um, we have, the ambulance fleet we have is actually two less ambulances than it was five years ago. And so we struggle on a daily basis with about a third of our ambulance fleet being down. We have 38 ambulances on any given day, about a third of it is down for repairs, warranty issues, stretchers broke, whatever it may be. So we have a task force looking at the need to grow those ambulances. We think we need to add eight to 10, probably need to add eight to 10 more ambulances to our fleet and there's limited capacity within the rescue squads to purchase those or to take on more debt in the form of the interest-free loans. I would remind you of those 38 ambulances, the city owns zero, they're owned independently by the rescue squads. Um, and then our current staffing efforts do not include any over hires or higher heads. And we know we have several provider retirements coming as believe it or not, we're now in the 20th year of the career system. 2004 is when we added career medics. So 20 years also means when they get their, their, um, retirement supplement eligibility, their Leo supplement eligibility. We know, have, we know we have several that are going to retire in the fall. And so, um, you know, we're not in position to be able to hire ahead. So we, we will try to respond to that the best we can. So that's all I have for you. The, um, I will tell you, and, and I would like to close on a positive note, um, the needs are great, obviously, um, but you have, we know, we understand there's a big picture and we're one piece in it. We know you have a lot of decisions to make. We know you've been supportive. Um, however, you know, we, we are not there yet, but we're doing much better than we have. So we'll continue to work hard. We'll continue to deliver a service um, and we give appreciative for whatever support you're able to provide us. Michael. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Chief. I'm really I'm grateful for your presentation, and um, I know we all are, but I'm a big fan of VBEMS and big supporter and really grateful for the work that you do. And um, we have a very unique system in Virginia Beach, and I think you noted that. 
And, and one part of that system is that we have these volunteer rescue squads that operate as, as one, they operate as independent units forming one division that serves the entire city. And I'll give a special shout out to Plaza Volunteer Rescue and Station 16, um, as well as Kempsville in particular that served District 3. But really, all of our, all 10 districts are served by every, by every unit. And what I see from the units is that they pay for their own ambulances through zero interest loans provided by the city. And they pay for the ambulances by having a fundraiser awards dinners, silent auctions. I know um, Plaza has a craft sale coming up on April 17th, I think. Nice. Um, and it's very good sale and it's, and it's a lot of fun and it's a great community connector. And there's a lot of value there. The truth is with the rising costs in ambulances, I don't think we're going to, I don't, I'm just curious. I'm wonder, I'm concerned that we're not going to be able to, that they are not going to be able to raise the funds needed to pay for not only the current fleet, but for all the needs that you articulated before. What are we going to do about that? Yeah, I think, um, I think your concern, I share that concern um, as does the rescue council president in leadership. And so I think, um, as, as you're aware, the Rescue Council, with the support of the city um, in cost sharing, has initiated a study to assess um, revenue recovery opportunities um, as a potential source of sustainable funding. I think as, as we all consider those opportunities, you know, we've, we likely will need to consider um, how those could also be opportunities for an ambulance replacement CIP for the squads, um, and I also believe that we're as this that at some point we're likely going to have to be thoughtful about um, a pur purposeful allocation of capital funding for to purchase some ambulances directly for the rescue squads. So I have a couple of follow up questions. How much was an ambulance three four years ago? One hundred and fifty to one hundred and seventy five. It, it literally increased one hundred thousand dollars overnight, and that's that's not a saying. That's actual literal. Like they. Everybody got notice that that would occur. So on average, our rescue squads are seeing ambulance purchase prices of two seventy five to three hundred thousand. And that's just for is that just for the box or does that include the equipment that's inside? That's just for the the chassis and the box. Yeah. And all of the bandages, the tubes, and and medicine and everything EMS supplies. E yeah. EMS yeah. supplies. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. Chief yeah. Counselor. Yeah. All of those things. <laughs> Um, are those are also provided by the rescue squads. Um, they are. So we have this unique system, as, you, as you've identified. Um, for the most part, uh, most of the rescue squads purchase a lot of their own soft goods, those, those medical supplies, those EMS supplies. The, I call them tubes. But. The department helps with some of the equipment, the hardware equipment, so like the cardiac monitors, the city purchases. So, so it's this unique partnership. But the, the investment made by the volunteer rescue squads is is perhaps almost immeasurable. I mean, but it's immense. It is immense. It's, it is immeasurable. It is extraordinary. And um, I just want us to go into this eyes wide open. And I think this relates to all the other conversations that we had. We think about the wise appropriation of taxpayer resources and how, I mean, because we can't afford, and I'm not going to compare this to any other thing that we discussed today, but we can't afford Lose a life because when someone calls nine one one, there's not an ambulance available or near them that has the equipment that it needs. And while I do love the system that we have, and and I think there's a lot of value actually in citizens coming together, and I participate myself as a donor, and to raise the funds needed to purchase and to supply these vehicles. Um, we have to be aware of the rising costs, and we can't afford to have to to have a, have a gap present where that, that someone calls nine one one, and there's not a vehicle outfitted, staffed, ready to respond to that life or death situation. Yes, sir. Something we need can, uh, to, to be thinking about. So, <laughs> right along with Council Member Richard. 
I have one other uh, thing too is I applaud you for hiring. You know, you've gotten some good people on board. I, I do hope you can do what you can with the one from Fire, but we appreciate you I'm taking him good. on. Um, but oh, oh, seriously, it's just a follow on with Councilman Berlucci. And it kind of goes for KP as well, is, is that I wanted everybody to kind of hear you. It's not only a cost thing, uh, what's, your, what's your timeline if you placed an order for an ambulance? Sure. How long, how long are we looking at before you'd have said ambulance in the city? January 2026 would be the best case, best case scenario. And that's the same or longer for a fire engine or a ladder. Um, so we're trying to do some creative financing on those kind of fronts, buying two ladders at once, uh, multiple ambulance purchases, trying to get things done so that we can offset those by the price at today's low, low cost, which is not low, low. Um, so that I just wanted to point that out that I think that's one of your challenges as well. Yes, sir. Forward with this. Okay, Chris. Thank you, Mayor Dyer. Uh, thank you for coming today and wrapping up the presentation. Can you just uh, again, what is the ambulance cost today? Uh, Two hundred seventy-five to three hundred thousand dollars. I think it's a fair estimate. How many do we need? We're working through that project now. However, preliminarily, we believe we need eight to 10 additional. We have 38 currently. Eight to 10. And it's not realistic to think we're going to get eight to 10 in the next funding for eight to 10 in the next 12 to 24 months, unless. I don't, based on what I understand of your finances, no, I don't think that's realistic. All right. And the, the, man, I, the manager's nodding his head. So. And the reason I asked that question is I want to go back to the retreat. And then again, actions we've taken since. Um, there's been an identification of a way we could fund some of these sources. And I want to, again, for the public, because I think some missed out on the comments from the retreat um, in working with Kevin to come up with and I, this, this form of rededicating and looking at dedicated fund sources, 2% um, reduction in amusement tax that's going into the tip uh, across the city um, would be $1.56 million, $1.5 million. A nickel in the cigarette tax equals $518,000. That's $2 million. So we could, uh, if we directed the manager as we did last week, uh, as a council, we could direct the manager to identify a dedicated funding source for EMS ambulances. Um, and right here we have just a couple of examples without going into a deep dive of two million dollars, and that would equal uh, at two seventy-five almost eight ambulances. So I just want you to be aware that these conversations are taking place, but ultimately it's up to the body. And last week we did make a uh, we did direct the manager to identify a dedicated funding source for another priority, and so we do have the ability to to help you. We just have to go in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks for hanging in there. All right, moving along. The chair will entertain a motion to recess into a closed session pursuant to the exemptions from the open meetings allowed by section 2.2 37.11a code of Virginia as amended for the following publicly held property discussions or consideration or acquisition of real property for a post public purpose or the disposition of publicly held property for a discussion in an open meeting for diversity bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body Section to 2.2311A3, uh, District 2, District 2, District 2, District 6, and personal matters, discussions, considerations, interviews, or prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointments, demotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resignation of specific public officers, appointees, or employees of public body pursuant to Section 2.2311A1. Council appointments, boards, commissions, committees, authorities, agencies, and appointees. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Councilman Belucci. Aye. Councilman Hamlin. 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 Aye. 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 Aye.
thank you all for your a great day today. Thank you. Very good. <laughs>